Welcome to another episode of the Rumcast. I am John Gullah. On the line with me is Will Hookinga. And with our hosting powers combined, we are the podcast that talks about all things rum related with the people who shape it. Uh, we have a great episode lined up for today with an in depth interview talking rum with one of our favorite reviewers, Lance Saruj Bali, otherwise known as the Lone Caner. But before we get to that main event, Will, tell me what's been going on in your rum world as of late. I love that that intro for for Lance. It sounds kind of like an old Western thing. I don't know. It made me. Th- I, I I really. I don't think I've ever seen anything Lone Ranger related, but it just it made me the, think yes. of that. <laughs> So that's probably just Western culture has probably just embedded that in my mind somehow. Somehow, because that is totally what that is. And I'm sure Lance, when he listens to this, will will roll his eyes in the back of his head with it. But I had to mention it. I, I think of it every time I see it. But it is still a really cool name. So. Yeah, love it. Well, I over here, before we get to all that, I'm feeling really thankful. Uh, just wanted to say thank you to everyone who has posted, messaged, texted, emailed, carrier pigeoned us about <laughs> our Fiji rum release with Holmes Key, which we yes. talked about at length in our previous episode with Eric K. So I won't go into that again, but definitely go back and check out that episode if you missed it. Uh, it's, it's just been really fun to kind of get to share that release with people both online and in person a few times as yeah. well now. I've yet to have anyone spit it in my face and tell me they hate it. It's been all positivity, (laughs) including from like, I, you know, I feel like people who would tell me otherwise if they didn't like it. So that's been really great just to get to experience that and share it with people. So thank you, everyone who has picked up a bottle of that and let us know about it. If you haven't yet. Please, and you you have a bottle, again, send us a message on social media, email us about it. We'd love to hear what you think. And yeah, uh, so that's been really cool. But what has been going on in your world, John? Well, same as you, I've been enjoying uh, a lot of the comments and, and had a few people over this weekend to, to uh, share in some uh, Holmes Key Fiji rum with, and, and they really enjoyed it too. And like you, I think I think people would tell me, you know, I, I, I think they would mention if it was just okay or whatever, but they, they really enjoyed it. The, the best comment ever is like, I would buy this. Where do I buy it? Yeah. Right now, right? That's that's the one you're like, yes, okay, all right. I, we know we're on to something. But I, I'm actually excited to talk today. Uh, Will, I have two favorite hobbies. Okay. And I think uh, longtime listeners will, of course, know what these are and you, which is rum and gaming. Rum, rum and hobby board games. Exactly. I should specify, so, yeah, tabletop board games. Thank you. Not video tabletop, games. Tabletop. Right. Well, hey, I love video games too, but that's a whole other show. <laughs> um, but, you know, there was something that was cool that I wanted to bring to the show that, that combines those two. And oh. that's a rare thing. And before, hold on, before I get into that, I wanted to remind people hobby board games are different than like the standard family board games in a lot of ways. I feel like people listening to the show are like, Monopoly. So you're, yeah, life? you're just not you're not sitting at yeah. home playing Monopoly and Sorry and Life every weekend, right? I played exactly. I played Life by the way with my five year old nephew for the first oh, okay. time That's since acceptable. since I yes. was a kid. Yes. Let me tell you, I loved that game when I was a kid, but he was not into it at all. He might be a little too young for it, actually, but yeah. he, he became quickly bored with it. But Might be a different generation. Yeah, yeah, they've changed some stuff, too. Like, buying a house, totally optional now. You you might you can oh. go through the whole game without even, you know, getting to you that point. You can be point. a vagrant. I know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm taking away from where you were going with that, so please continue. No, no, I- I was going to say, like, a good comparison for, for rum hobbyists would be Monopoly is to board games as, like, what Captain Morgan is to rum. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, all your board game yeah. friends are, like, over there laughing at people playing Monopoly and stuff, saying, <laughs> yeah. like, get a real game, why don't you? Right, right. <laughs> it, it's like, everybody knows it, you know, and you may have experienced it, and maybe you thought when you had it, it wasn't that awful until you found out, okay. like, oh my god, there's this whole world of other amazing things that absolutely uh, shadow... I love that. This, I love this. that analogy. That's a yeah. good one. Yeah. So anyway, I wanted to discuss this uh, current board game project that's on Kickstarter right now, and it's called Distilled. Okay. So it, it's a, a strategic card game for one to four players. It's thematically driven around the concept of distilling spirits and managing your resources to build up the best distillery. Wow. Can you build a rum distillery in this game? You can. Well, so the premise of the game is you're bequeathed a distillery from your relative. Always nice to be bequeathed something. (laughs) Right? I know. And uh, it has a pot still within it, which is depicted in the game. Do they call it a pot still or did they just use like a generic still picture that happened to be a pot still? 
it's a good question. So because it's a Kickstarter project, I haven't got a copy. I haven't okay. played it yet. There's going to be questions that you'll ask. I probably don't know because I'm just looking at the information here and deciding whether to back it on Kickstarter. Okay. But there is a depiction of a pot still. Uh, it does look like the creator, Dave Beck, he's uh, he's actually, I spoke to him briefly online. Okay. And he's a professor at a game of game design at a University of Wisconsin Stout. They have and, professors uh, of game design now? They do. Wow. I, yes, I, I would assume to be one i'm a little <laughs> old at this point but yeah so he he does that and then on the side he enjoys spirits and in, including scotch and rum nice so he decided he was going to get those two things together and make this game anyway so the the idea here is that the game is played through acquiring cards okay and those cards represent goods and resources of various types that you need to distill and take your product all the way from the raw ingredients through distillation through aging, and into bottling and selling. So it, it runs the whole gamut there. So if I'm over here trying to build my dream rum distillery, I'm trying to get, you know, maybe some some molasses cards or maybe some cane juice cards, maybe some some different various types yes. of yeast cards, I would guess. Yes. Am I on the right it, track here? Exactly right, right. So you've got sugar cane and you've got, you can do, you know, molasses or sugar cane juice. And again, I don't know all the specifics, but you've got water, you've got yeast, you've got things of that nature. Now, rum is not the only spirit in the game. Right. So you can go for whiskey you can go for bourbon and get corn and Mm -hmm. you know there's different paths here but rum is one of the featured ones which is great you can also have cards that depict staff so like you want to hire a master blender or a master distiller because although you've been given this distillery it doesn't mean you have yeah i mean the i don't know what the the hell i know how (laughs) exactly like, imagine if you were given a distillery, Will, what are you going to do? You're going you're gonna to experiment? Wait, so is the Maybe. premise that I inherited this, this distillery, but all that's in it is the still? All that's in it is the still at this point, okay. yes. And there's an aging warehouse, but I, I don't think the idea is you start with anything. All right, okay. In that way, you get some money, you get a still, and you get some space. And so you take those cards and those ingredients, and th- those cards, like I mentioned, they could be also staff. You could have barrels, so you have different aging barrels right. that you can utilize, and you can yeah various those, cooperage. Uh, yeah, exactly. So once you have enough of your resources, you will shuffle an amount of those ingredients face down, and you will discard the top and the bottom from this little small deck you've created, and that represents getting rid of the heads and the tails of the distillate. Oh my which gosh! I was wow, kind of cool. Yeah, and then you flip over the rest, and that will show what you've kind of made. Can I save uh, my tails to make a queen share? You can. Are, are you serious? No. You, you, it says that? They don't call it a queen share, okay. right? You, you can't. What it does is it has you save the heads and the tails to use in future rounds. Okay. All right. So yeah. I don't know how exactly, but you do save them, which was kind of cool. That so is cool. I thought that was interesting. I'm intrigued in this. Um, I'm going to have to look this up. Maybe I'll back it, and maybe we can go head to head at some point. We should. And I think it's even online. So you can even do it. I'm going to run your distillery out of town, buddy. (laughs) I don't think so. I've got the gaming experience (laughs) behind me. That's true. I'm probably going to get waxed. I'm going to best you on this one. (laughs) Anyway, to finish it up. So you'll get these cards. You get this distillate. You put it underneath a barrel card, which represents its aging in the barrel. Right. And then every round that you this is played over rounds you know successive rounds and every round that you have this distillate in the barrel aging you get to add a flavor profile card which represents the aging imparting something to the distillate okay so you know cinnamon or caramel or anything like like that kind of thing and that helps the quality of your spirit and then when you're ready to bottle and sell it the more of those type of things you have in there, the better prestige you will get from it. You will score more points and you will make more money. And then with that money, you do it all over again. And that's how it works. Is there an added sugar card? <laughs> Had to do it. Uh, Had to do it. I don't believe so. That might be in an expansion. We'll, we'll ask uh, Dave <laughs> back, the creator, if that will be an expansion to it. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's that's exciting. Uh, I thank you for bringing that to our attention. And I'm definitely going to look into this and see yeah. about acquiring myself a set. Um, yes. Go on over to kickstarter.com and look for it. Uh, right. I think it's on there for another 20 days or so, if I remember, something like that. So you know how Kickstarter is only limited time. Right. Uh, but I was going to say, it's not an unpopular project right now. That's great. It's, I think, in the top 10 of all Kickstarter projects at the moment. It's made over $150,000 oh in God. seven days. I mean, it's What am it's I doing going. with it's, my life? It's doing its thing, right? I know. So yeah, get on there and, and look for it. That's awesome. I will. 
I, I don't know how to transition from that into our interview, <laughs> but I will just say I'm extremely excited about this interview. This is one of my favorite conversations we've had on the show. Um, Me too. As you mentioned earlier, we talked to Lance Suresh Bali, who many people will recognize by his website name, thelonecaner.com. Lance is someone we've been meaning to talk to for a long time, and we kind of just had to find the right topic. And what we settled on was he, I, I think most people know him for his reviews, but if you've paid attention for a while, you know he also publishes other types of articles and things on the site. And one of the series that he's done over the years is a series called The Key Rums of the World. And it's one of my favorite things that he's done. It's, I think, a really valuable thing for the rum world right now. Lance does such a good job of kind of introducing the premise of Mm -hmm. it that I thought I would just read the first paragraph of his kind of the article where all of the various entries live to kind of set up what the key rums of the world series is. So here's his introduction to it. There are certain rums which are not at the top of the quality ladder, yet year in and year out, they have so many vocal adherents and champions, so many references throughout the literature, are so reasonably priced for the quality they do have, and come up in just about every conversation about a particular country's, or perhaps company's, rums, that they can reasonably be called key rums of the world." They belong on the shelf of every rum lover who wishes to gain insight into the wide profile variations and geographical dispersion rum embodies. So that's the whole kind of, well, not the whole, that's part of the context for what this series is. But I I just wanted to quickly cover like why I think this is such a valuable piece of rum literature on the internet right now. Number one, If you're newer to rum, it's really, really useful as just a list to go through of like, what should I try, you know, early on in kind of your your journey into rum. Number two, if you're a little more experienced, like if you've had most of these rums, and I believe there's 16 entries in the series so far. So if you've had most of these um, and you've had a few years to explore the category, it's really fun, I find, to challenge yourself to come up with, you know, what would I define as the key rums of the world if I had to, you know, do this? That's been a fun mental exercise for me. like a sweet 16 bracket. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Um, And and then number three, it's also really fun to go back and explore some of these rums. I'm actually, this weekend, I'm going to take out all of these that I have on hand right now and kind of go back through them while reading the corresponding key rum essay. Uh, And just to kind of set it up in advance, I want to quickly run through what the 16 rums are in the list so far, just so people have some conception going into the interview of of what Lance thinks of as key rums of the world. So uh, just going to run through these real quick. Appleton 12, El Dorado 21, Mount Gay XO, El Dorado 15, Diplomatico Reserva Exclusiva, Rivers Antoine White, English Harbor 10-Year-Old, The Foursquare Exceptional Cask Series, Barbancourt Reserve Special 8-Year-Old, Pusser's 15-Year-Old, Damaso Rum View Agricole 5-Year-Old, J. Ray and Nephew White Overproof, Santa Teresa 1796, St. James 12-Year-Old, The Habitation Valier Series, and Dourley's 12-Year-Old. So, mm, if you're hearing that, that for like the first graduation. time, you might immediately have all kinds of questions going off in your head. Yeah. And the good news is, we're going to answer probably all of them during this interview. Because, it, like I said, it's one of my favorite interviews. We spent a lot of time talking with Lance about this. He has so much passion and such such um, interesting you know, views on rum. And just, I think you'll really feel that in the interview. Like, so much energy, so much love of rum in the interview. Mm. I, I think it's delightful to to listen to and he's got a great sense of humor so i'm very excited and i don't want to spend any more time teeing up this interview too much so let's just get right into it We are here with Lance Suraj Bali, aka The Lone Caner, aka Raminsky, aka. I, do you have any other rum related nicknames? I, I was trying to acquire them all before the show, Lance, but I'm not sure if I touched on them. But either no. way, it's it's great to have you here. 
Thank you. It's good to be here. You're one of the people that we've had written down, you know, as a guest we want to have on for probably since we started the show. And a lot of times it's just a matter of, you know, trying to figure out, you know, I know we should have so-and-so on, like, what's what's the right way to frame the conversation? And you've written so much um, and, you know, added so much to the rum world that I think it just took us a while to arrive on the right idea. But uh, it hit me the other day, like, we should talk about the key rums of the World Series because it's it's such an ambitious project. I think it holds real value for the rum world. I love reading each of the pieces. I know John feels the same. Yeah, so we wanted definitely. to kind of dig into that and talk about it. But before we we get into all of that, um, what's what's new with you and the Lone Caner? What, what have you been working on lately? What has your attention these days uh, in all things rum? Well, uh, I had a huge uh, hiccup in April of this year when my site went dead. It did? And, uh, I must have missed oh, that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, I saw it. Uh, yeah. It crashed, I and I, I, it, I think there was a malware infection at the, uh, the GoDaddy, and uh, they, were, they were my web hosts. So I spent, I spent about a week just trying to get past that and get through these idiots who um, kept telling me I should hire an external agency to fix the problem when they didn't even try to fix the problem first. I find the sixth person did actually fix it, but at the cost of losing a lot of metadata. Oh, no. So although mm. the data itself was there, everything, every kind of statistic is gone. So I, all the tags are gone, all the categories are gone, all the, uh, oh, the likes, man. you know, that says something about user engagement, uh, all that's gone. So I've been literally spending every, a little part of every day in between my other duties trying to re- rebuild that. And that has kind of drawn me back a bit from some of the things I'd much rather be doing, which is the research on the long form articles, which I always do. So normally the routine for me is that I try to write two reviews a week. And that's not hard and fast rule. It's just something I fell into. Three is too much and too stressful. One just doesn't quite do it for me. Two is just about right um, mm-hmm. because I can take a break in between them and put them in at the beginning and the end of the week. You know, so somebody comes to work on a Monday and finds something there, and then before he leaves on a Friday, <laughs> oh yeah, look, there's something. <laughs> you know, so there's that. But um, aside from that, what I've been working on is a lot of opinion pieces because one of the things that I found out in just paying close attention over the last two years mm-hmm. is that there is a lot of different issues that are starting to come up in a way that didn't come up before. And we could talk about something like uh, the Juve rum that uh, issue that happened last week. Michael B. We, Jordan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And uh, we could talk, you know, and, and this, oh, this, threw, this throws out all sorts of little tendrils into other aspects of things like disclosure or labeling. I mean, I could trace it in all different directions. And so I've been putting together a series of opinions on that subject that just need to be polished because uh, they're usually brain dumps. And that's not right. good because they lack yeah. coherence and consistency. and They don't make the point strongly enough or even issue a recommendation, which is a problem I have with too many opinions that other people issue. I'd like mm. to at least say, OK, well, here's what I think, but this is why I yeah. think so. And this is what I yeah. think the solution is. So I've been Lance, working I'm, on those. I'm 100 percent brain dumps, unfortunately. So I need to work on my skills. We, I, I'll, I'll pattern after you some so I can work on getting rid of those brain dumps. <laughs> <laughs> Right? That makes sense. <laughs> the other thing is um, two long-term projects I have that have been literally going on for the last year and a half. And one of them is simply trying to catalog rums from different geographical areas mm. with my own spin on it. Like, for example, Will, I know that you have done this incredible database of uh, rum distilleries in the United States. Well, you call it incredible. Th- I know all the stuff that's missing from it. So yeah. I'm glad. I'm I glad don't that- doubt that. But <laughs> look at it this way. The, the Burrs also had theirs. The two in, com- in combination are really an incredible resource. And I refer to them quite often when I do research on stuff from the United States, but I'd like to see stuff happening from places that aren't that well known because everybody knows about what's going on in Europe and everybody Mm -hmm. knows what's going on in Asia, more or less, you know, uh, particularly Japan and Australia. And of course, the United States, everybody knows what's going on more or less, but there are still a lot of places that aren't. And uh, there's the Indian Ocean Islands, there's the Mm -hmm. African nations, South Africa, particularly, and so on. So I'm trying to just kind of put together some stuff there, the companies and the background and something of the history of places that people don't normally associate with rum. I love that because I it was actually I just pulled up your site and was just looking at the most recent reviews and it, um, I, I, I 
can't recall the independent bottler it was, but it was it's like an Italian bottler? You you reviewed a yeah Moon a Import, yeah Moon Moon Imports, and I was just thinking to myself, I it would be great if there was some way to to visualize all of these different independent bottling companies and like where they are and just have a better sense of wrapping your brain around them. Um, well, that was strangely enough, that's what the Maker series of the website has morphed into. Because initially, I thought that what I really wanted to do was to write about just about every single company that not enough was written about. But then as I got deeper and deeper into rums, I realized that, no, 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 there are books out there already. There's a book on Worthy Park. There's a book on uh, Hampton, I believe, somewhere floating around. There's Luca's book, Atlas du Rum. There's uh, all these other sources of material that cover all this stuff right. really well. So to pretend that I could add to this incredibly researched volume of information is... It's delusional, to say the least. I, so, I disagree. I don't think it's delusional at all. And I think one of the things that John and I both love so much about your website is how valuable it feels. And even yeah. as this you know, repository of information and capturing a period in time in rum, um, it, and that, that's why I try to reiterate to everyone when I recommend your site to them that it's 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 not just a review site. There's, there's, there's more in there than just, and that's not to belittle the value of a review. Reviews are great. But it, when you were talking about, you know, the malware issue, um, that, that made me, my, my heart skip a beat. Cause I was like, I'm sure that you have backups and stuff like that of the site, but just like, I want to make sure it's kept safe. Cause I think it's a resource, yeah. you know, and it needs to survive for, uh, for many years to well, come. Well, you make a point that I have started to realize more and more often, like, okay, so the, the site went down for about a week, mm -hmm. right? Now, up to that point, I was getting, and this may be a function of COVID itself, right? Because I noticed that ever since uh, everybody shut down and nobody could travel and nobody could do anything, the site started to tick up. So before that, I was about five to 600 views a day. And that climbed over the next year in 2020 in particular to something like 1,000 a day, 1,200 wow. a day. This, this is unbelievable, yeah. right? I'd never had that kind of traffic before. And then... The site dropped for a week, and then when it came back, it went back to pre-COVID levels to up about mm. four to 500 a day. Mm. But when I started analyzing what exactly had happened, I realized that there's an uptick twice a week when I post a review. Yeah. But really, the majority of the views don't come from those. The majority of the views come from people who are doing research of their own. They're in a shop somewhere, or they're looking mm -hmm. for an auction, or they find some old thing that they haven't seen before. They say, okay, yeah, I guess anybody actually wrote. But just today on Facebook, I noticed that there was some guy asking about the Berry Brothers and Rum, 1980, uh, 1982 and 1977 Jamaicans. And lo and behold, you better believe it, somebody, like 13 posts down, <laughs> said, Lone Caner, Lone Caner. And this is where the views come from. Uh -huh. Not actually current stuff, but the older stuff. And this is, ties exactly into what you mentioned about resources. So right. I love doing the reviews. I think that they are really important, but the work on the older stuff that nobody will ever see until some dark night in a rum shop somewhere, somebody says, what on earth was this? You know, then it comes into its own. And I like knowing that, but uh, I have to rebuild the site to make sure that happens. And thankfully, none of the information was lost. So it's just a question of rebuilding links and stuff. So the searches still find them. And that's good for me. Yeah, well, I'm I'm glad that you're taking on the task of, of rebuilding that, and I've I've dealt with one of those issues before with a, a website for my freelancing business of malware and everything, and it can be a, it's it's so annoying to deal with. So I'm glad that you got through it. But to to give just a little background to everyone, I, I know a lot of listeners are familiar with their website, um, or they've at least seen it, but I, I don't know how many actually know a little bit about your backstory. So I wanted to touch briefly before we get into key rums and everything. Just the, the, the big picture, how you ended up starting the Lone Caner and what pushed you to do it in the first place, because I know rum goes back very far in your life. And I'd, I'd love for you to, to kind of give people a context for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I covered this in Indy's interview last year, but uh, uh -huh. uh, and I was actually watching that for just to refresh my memory. But the bottom line is, is that uh, I lived a large part of my life in Guyana and uh, I am actually half Guyanese. And um, my first drinks were actually rums, always yeah. had been. I, they mm -hmm. weren't that many whiskeys unless they were locally made. Vodka never really appealed to me that much, which was like, kind of ironic, given that I ended up in Central Asia where they drink nothing but vodka. Yeah. You know? um, but I liked rums. Always, I was kind of drunk and got my first drunk with them. And mm -hmm. um, although that took a hiatus as I started working around the world, eventually I ended up in 
probably the best province in Canada to be able to drink rum in or to drink any kind of alcohol in, and that's Alberta, which is the only deregulated province in the whole country, and tells me a lot as to why I don't like government monopolies or regulations <laughs> of the commercial <laughs> industry. I don't mm-hmm. think the government should be in industry. Right? I think they should regulate it, absolutely. But, you know, let's be honest, it's a commercial thing and you get taxes from it. So what's the problem here? You know, but anyway. That's a separate issue. <laughs> so in Alberta, I was fortunate enough to get in, there's an enormous variety of rums out there, some cheap, not some not so cheap. And there's lots of lots of little mom and pop stores around that have all these rums that are literally unfindable anywhere mm-hmm. else in the country, yeah. except maybe Quebec. And at the roughly around the same time, a friend of mine called Kurt Robinson, who started his, uh, who has a site called All Things Whiskey, he and I, mostly with his uh, initiative, started a rum club called Literature in 2009, in February 2009. I love that name, and by the way. It, isn't Licorature. it great? I mean, yeah. I, I, <laughs> he kept it. He didn't want to sell it to me or give it to me or <laughs> let me have it because I just thought that was such a beautiful name for a The website's a still up, by the way. Yes, and it still is. has it's some of your, your early writing on it. I went back and was looking at it. It's great. Yeah, exactly. It's um, I miss it. Uh, I, when I go back to Canada, I'm going to enjoy being a part of that again in some fashion. But um, Kurt started that off with me, and we met fairly regularly once a month. And we it was mostly whiskeys that were coming in, which is one reason why I actually know a fair bit more about whiskeys than people think I do. It's just that they don't interest me that much, so I don't research them that deeply. But when my time came to host, I started putting rums through the door, and then gradually he said, you know, why don't we just start a website to do this and to record our thinking about it and to review our books? Because think about it. It won't be specialized. It'll have whiskeys, and it'll have rums, and it'll have mm. books. I mean, with three of mm. those things, our hits are going to go through the roof, which didn't really happen, but it was a nice idea. <laughs> so for the next three years, uh, the literature started January of 2010. By then, I had already written about uh, 15, 20 reviews, which I thought was incredible. Um, I mean, it is. Most people, I I mean, you see people all the time who start and, you know, it's a tough thing to stick with. It does take a little bit of effort for sure. Um, Yeah, at the inception, I think I was writing like one a week or one every two weeks or something like that. And I thought that was good. Um, You know, the rum hauler, he was in Edmonton, 300 Mm -hmm. miles to the north. So he was he was somebody that I took some amount of uh, guidance from. And he and I met fairly regularly to discuss the matter. But uh, eventually what happened in around 2012 is that Kurt split off his whiskey work into his own site, All Things Whiskey, and that left me in literature. And at some point I said, you know what, I really would like to have a site of my own too. Um, it, so it isn't subsumed into a site that I don't actually own. So I opened right. the Lone Caner as a site in March of 2013, by which time I think I had about a 70 or 80, maybe 100 reviews out there. I forget how many it was. It was, it was what I thought was a fair bit, you know, little did I know. <laughs> And um, by that time, a lot of things started to change. And it was really peculiar because in 2012, I had gotten in contact or with Velia Rums for the first time. And I started writing about them, which really created an uptick of interest in, in the site. Mm. And I also moved away from Canada that time at, in 2013 to take up duties uh, where I am now. And that kind of like totally truncated everything that I was doing for a year straight until I figured out a way to get around it. And, you know, the Lone Cane has been ticking along ever since. And I've been really happy to do it. It's been a lot, a lot of fun. And um, I've managed to go off in different branches that I never even considered back in the in the beginning. For example, there was uh, the Maker series, which we touched on very briefly earlier, mm-hmm. where I tried to talk about certain companies that perhaps are not that well known and their history and their background and their backstory and whatever to say something about them. Not the, not the ones that everybody else knows about, but little, it kind of focuses almost on independence, right? Because the first one was Velier, the second one was Rum Nation. Mm-hmm. And then I went into Nine Leaves and I went into Takamaka Bay out of the Seychelles and a bunch of others. And it was a lot of fun because the research is incredible. You really got to pay attention to that. And unlike a review, you actually can bring the company into the equation because it's nonfiction. It's not an opinion. These are facts that you're talking about. So if you want to talk about, let's say, Bristol Spirits, you pick up the phone and you talk to uh, John Barrett and you say, listen, what can you tell me about the origin and this and that? And where's your master list of everything that you do? And oh, that was such a lot of fun. Um, It it really does take a lot of time to do right and do well, but I enjoy it thoroughly. And in 2014, a bunch of us got together in Paris and created the Romaniacs, which unfortunately is somewhat of a dormant society, but I keep it going because I think it has great worth. And that's well, it's a great name. Talk. You have to at least keep the name going. 
Oh, well, right. The whiskey, I think it was the, was it the Malt Maniacs where it's a thing back then? I think Serge Valentin, who was at that meeting, by the way, he was a member of Malt Maniacs and perhaps he suggested it. Um, but it kind of like came up and there is actually a site for the Romaniacs, by the way, you know, where all of, oh yeah, okay, your web dot something or the other. Oh yeah, it's there. Okay. Um, and everything that the others have written is on that site, not just mine. Hmm. And the the Romaniacs for people wish uh, listening is basically you were taking rums that are essentially defunct, old old bottles of rum that aren't Correct. in production anymore, and tasting those, reviewing them, kind of giving the backstory of them as as much as you could learn about them. Yes. And I thought that had great value. So that the idea was that the person who organized this whole thing would send us bottles. They would be split among the f- six of us. And then on that basis, you would do your writing and your evaluation and uh, that's it. So that's really kind of fun. But then it stopped. And I, I'm not, I'm never really sure why. I think interest was made, waned or something. But I kept it going with any old drum I could find because that's a nice place to park them. You don't always want to write a full length essay mm-hmm. about something that you barely know anything about. So I used the short form <laughs> version and I, and I wrote uh, the way Serge Valentin and Marius Elder write, you know, very brief, 200 words or so. Right. And then you move on. And a lot of fun, very informative as far as I'm concerned. And the research is always good for me because I love history. And some of these are really interesting too. Like, I mean, yeah. you know, Red Duster, whoever, the, you know, the Red Duster was a, a Navy room of sorts made in England. And yet I found out that it was actually the name of a, of a flag that was put on Navy ships. And I didn't oh, really? know that. So, oh, I was yeah. imagining so, like, a, like, a, like a plane, like a crop duster is what I was picturing. <laughs> there you go. You I, see? I was thinking Mars. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So there you go. You you find out all these little things when as you do your research, which are quite fascinating to me. And I'm sure that rum lovers around the place who like that kind of thing do too. So there was the makers. And then there was the Romaniacs. There was the regular side of reviews. There was opinions that I wrote whenever I felt like, lists that I made whenever mm-hmm. I felt like it. You know, um, but then what happened was I went to my little brother's wedding in Toronto in 2017 and several things happened all at the same time, which led to the formation of the key rum series. So first of all, I tried the uh, Appleton 12 year old and by some great coincidence, we had in the Romaniacs had just finished our rundown of some very old Appletons dating back to the 1960s. So I had a really good sense of what Appleton was doing over a period of a very long time. Yeah, And then I had also just written a piece on Velier called The Age of Velier's Demeraras. Yes. Mm-hmm. The part I, I would one say of, one of the seminal Lone Caner works. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I really love that uh, thing myself. I, I mean, I put a lot of love and time into it. Uh, but the first part was all about the history mm-hmm. of the way things were before Velier burst on the scene. And that took a lot of effort. But one thing I realized is that the Appleton 12-year-old was even older than I thought it had been. It had actually come from a series called the Three Dagger series of rums that they were making in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Right. I always remember hearing so much about the Three Dagger rums. Um, People, You're one of the few. Well, I I heard people, you know, who were consuming rum during the time they were out, you know, refer to them kind of longingly, you know, wishing that the Three Dagger were, were coming back at some point. And that sort of thing. So it's interesting. So Appleton 12 is similar to what was released under the Three Dagger kind of line. Yes, absolutely. And then I kind of wrote the review about it because I'd already done it before in 2010 or 2011, but now mm-hmm. I'm at 20, 2017, 2018, and I'm writing it again. And then I started thinking, oh, hang on a second, you know, this, they, there's more to this. So what happened was that I had also been asked no more than three months before this why I didn't retaste rums that I had tried before. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, in my interview with Indy last year, I said, okay, well, you know, I'm doing this shit for free. <laughs> you know, I'm paying huge amounts of money, not only to travel to rum fests, but to buy all these rums from all over the world. I pay for samples. I pay for this and this. And that. You know, do I really want to go back and pay again for a rum that I've got already in my stocks, I, which I probably haven't finished yet, and to do it all over again? Oh, no, I don't want to do Wait, this. Wait, you, you mean these companies aren't, aren't sending you all these samples for free and paying you to do this? They ask, but they always <laughs> refuse. Uh, it's oh. become a, once they did, once they did. And that mm-hmm. was when I was still very early and kind of like wet behind the ears. And I thought it would be kind of nice. And I gave one of the rums a, a fairly bad review. I thought it was just, a, wasn't that interesting. And um, I heard through a friend of mine that they were highly offended. Uh. And I swore I would never do it again. And yeah. I never mm-hmm. have. Um, I simply do not accept freebies. Um, if I do, there's got to be a compelling reason for it that outweighs my 
you know, my desire to remain as independent as possible under the circle. Right. And what I did with Florent, uh, Florent Boucher of Compagnie des Ailes, is he actually spotted me the 35-year-old uh, Hampton that he had put out for the Hong Kong market a couple okay. of years ago. He spotted me that on my specific request. But what I did is I sent him stuff in, in return. So my conscience was clear. I didn't get it for free. I actually right. gave him something in return. And this is what I follow with a lot of people who ask me, can I do this? Can I do that? And I say, usually I say, nope, sorry, not interested. But uh, if we can find a way to trade or to exchange or to pay, then we can talk. Otherwise, forget it. And most of the time, they mm -hmm. just walk away. Very strange. But that said, I was asked to retaste, all right? And I thought, okay, the, the, the idea hit me. And I thought... It kind of stuck. And I said, you know, the truth of the matter is I'm not the same person as I was, nor is the rum. They may have had batch variations since that time. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence, I thought it might be a good idea to perhaps do this a bit more seriously and see if I changed or whether my opinion changed. And I think it was the Cartavio Exo and the Panamonte 25, both uh, South American, Latin, Panamanian rums. I had given them really good scores back in the day in 2012 and 2013, but then my taste changed kind of radically. Velia was definitely responsible for that. Right. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> and I realized, you know what, uh, this might actually be a better idea than I thought at the inception. At the same time, not only did I taste, retaste the Eldorado, uh, sorry, the uh, Appleton 12 and the Eldorado 21 year old at my brother's house, but I began to get a little uncomfortable with this mad tearing rush to go after the latest exceptional cask series, which were, of course, already taking off at that time yeah. from mm -hmm. Foursquare, the latest in the, uh, Veliers, whatever they were, it didn't matter what they were. They, were, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. become a joke now that after the, um, I think the first time people saw it, this happen was with the 2006 10 year old that the collaboration with Foursquare. It sold out five minutes before it went on sale. Mm -hmm. and, and this is Shibboleth just today. People are pissed. I've heard yeah. the prices today. of that are, are, are it's on you know, Rum Auction. Yeah. It, it, it started out today and it's already on a rum auctioneer, 10 bottles. Wow. You know, I mean, the, yeah. you know, I wrote an essay on flipping to address this particular issue, and here it is yet again, mm -hmm. right? So yep. there's a problem with this. There's, um, there's a fixation now, and I'm not saying it's a bad one. I'm just saying it is one, mm -hmm. that people go after the independent bottlers and the dependent bottlers, as Velia likes to call itself, right. to the exclusion of what I would term old faithfuls, things that have workhorses of the time, the quiet classics, the rums that have been around like forever. Mm -hmm, and it yeah. occurred to me when I looked at the, uh, the Appleton 12, well, hang on a second, this is one of them, right? And um, I started thinking more and more about it. And I said, you know, it might be time to kind of like talk about these rums that are the poor man's best buys, uh, what Matt Petrick would call uh, for a suitcase rum, mm -hmm. right? Something you easily afford and tow home in your suitcase and still get value for money. The key really is value for money, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because you could pay $10,000 for a skeleton 1978, but is it 10 times as good or 100 times as good as something costing $100? Of course not. Right. It never will be. It's rarity that and status that confers that price. Right. And, and you referred to consistency as a possible here uh, as well with these some, some of these rums. Are, they've been around for a while, and you know what you're getting with the consistency or dependency upon that, yes. as opposed to, like you said, a limited release or from an independent bottler, which is a great experience, but unlikely to be duplicated, right? Correct. When, yeah. you, buy, when you buy from an independent bottler, a uh, single cask in particular, you know, you're know you getting a 300 bottles or so out there for the world. And with more and more rum drinkers coming on the scene every time, that 300, it's gone. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah. Right? Rum Nation and some others, they tend to put three or four bottles together into a release of maybe 1,000 or 1,500 bottles, which mm -hmm. kind of alleviates the problem. And certainly Velia does that too with some of its uh, Habitation Velia releases. But... Um, in the main, you get, you know, the independents just have single cask releases and that's all you get. And then they're gone. So it's very difficult to gauge long term quality on that basis. Plus, the price yeah. keeps going up and they, in the single casks are more expensive as a general rule, too. You know, 50 bucks and above or 100 bucks and above, you know, which not everybody can afford just because I can right now take one or two bottles at $100 in a month doesn't mean that other people are anything like me. No, they think right. that $50 is too much to pay and $40 is just about right. Well, and and that's access luxury is a big part of the equation, too. Right. Like, can you can you get it? Is there someone who will ship it to you? Is there a store nearby oh, that will carry don't get it? Don't me started on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't really okay, complain so. about that to you yet. <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah. Um, so it occurred to me that there was a space in people's estimation for rums of status that had perhaps fallen somewhat in people's idea of what the perfect or best rum in the world actually is. And mm. you'll be very you'll note that I was very careful to avoid the mention of either great or classic. Yes. 
I, this is because one of the things I, I love about it. The, the word key is key to this whole conversation. And right. one of the things, and, and John and I have talked about this, actually had long conversations about this when we've done episodes in the past, you know, like at, at the end of 2020, we wanted to kind of like highlight rums that we found were particularly enjoyable. And I think the natural inclination is to be like, bet what was the best rum of 2020? And it's like, no, like, I, I, I don't, I don't want to use the word best. I just like, can, can we just talk about what was, what was the rum that was our favorite of the year? Yeah. Um, a memorable right. rub that you had. Exactly. In this. Right, exactly. Right. What was memorable? What stood out to it? Why that to me is, is, I, I don't know when you get into best and everything like that, I just really struggle with it. And yet we see a new list and I know, I know uh, you have uh, many thoughts on all these various lists that come out across all these publications and such, but top 20. I have an, I have an opinion on that. Yeah, yeah <laughs> but exactly. Yeah. So anyway, pl- please continue on, on key rums. Okay, key, so yeah. I was thinking that there was a middle ground that uh, people had to be made aware in the intense social media frenzy of the most popular rums of the day that were, you know, the, uh, the St. Lucia Distillery's new releases or the uh, Antigua Distillery's new cask strength, whatever it was, or the Four Square mm-hmm. or the Mount Gay cask strength. Whatever. There had to be stuff that is a tier lower than that, but it had certain aspects to it that were important enough to warrant mention. And sometimes all it takes is one voice that says, guys, this you need to pay attention to. This is not a bad drum. Don't spend 150 over here when you can get this thing for 50 and it'll give you almost equivalent value. This is mm-hmm. the, the value for money equation to me that is so important for people of limited means, which is like most of us, right? Yeah. I mean, we don't have bottomless purses. My, you know, even after 11, 12 years of doing this, you know, it's, uh, it's financially, it's not that easy to keep doing. Right. right. You know, you have to pay at some point in time, right? So there was that. At the same time on Reddit, I was getting much more involved in the RRUM Reddit uh, subreddit. Mm -hmm. One of the most consistent questions that you find there, as well as now on Facebook, is what do I start? Where do I start? Mm -hmm. Where do I start? And of course, this is very difficult for anybody to answer clearly because of the sheer variety globally of what rum is. Now, something from Australia that uh, Beanley would put out is completely different from something that Yoshihara Takeuchi would do over at Nine Leaves, which is completely different from what... privateer is doing over in the United States, and we won't even discuss on how they compare with Hampton and Barbados and St. Right. Lucia and Guyana. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, there's just so much out there. And the poor the poor guys who go out there, or the girls, sorry, you know, who go out there and they say, okay, wait, I've heard so many good things about rum is the next big thing. I got to start somewhere. What do I start with? And of course, shop people are almost no help at all. Yeah, you know? it's very, uh, it can so, be very hit or miss what you're going to get yep. from someone in, in a store. So I needed to start thinking about a way to address that. So all this stuff came together. You know, um, I wanted to uh, reassess a number of the old stalwarts. I felt that attention should be paid to the mid-range. I felt that I needed to know and write a little bit more about helping people what to start with. Um, and then, of course, it all came together. And I said, ah, here's an idea. But I had to set the criteria. The criteria was so important because otherwise people wouldn't understand what I was trying to do. And Mm -hmm. actually, one of the first questions I got offline, it never appeared on the site, but somebody did email me and says, oh, great. So you're talking about like unicorns, right? Halo rum. And I said, champion, yeah, I'd love to, but anything above 90 points that I write about is con- could conceivably be that. And of course, I've been incredibly fortunate in my career to be able to have some really amazing rums dating back from the 1800s in some cases, or the wow. uh, Harewood 1780. I tried that mm. at the tasting of the century, or the Bali 1924, or the uh, Damoiseau 1953. You know, so these are things that are historical artifacts. They're like right. fossils stuck in our mental minds of what rum is. But mm-hmm. most people don't have that. And I don't want to pretend that anybody can get these. So I basically came up with a series of rules, a series of criteria, protocols, as uh, Luca would sometimes say. Did you have the, did you know that you were going to refer to the series as key rums before you made the criteria? Or did key rums come after the criteria? Do you remember? Same t- at the same time, same because time. all okay. this happening in a single all, day. all converging. Yeah. I had already written the uh, Appleton 12 and I'd put it in the regular review section, but I had started to write 
what is surprisingly enough, you'd be surprised, but the, my favorite of all of the key rums is the El Dorado 21 year old, the second one. Okay. And the reason why is because it's not actually that much of a review as a meditation on moving on and getting old. Hmm. Well, I know um, you, you I, talk about, um, you, you mentioned the 21, I believe, is your favorite, while your father favors yes. the 15, right? So you have <laughs> yes. that kind of family oh. connection to, to the. the <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Why you don't know what you're talking about, man? That <laughs> mean nothing, boss. What are you telling me? The twenty-one. Why go away from here? You know, and uh, we have this conversation every once every few once every few years. But uh, we should we should yeah. have brought dad on the podcast too. Yeah, it like. that would have been amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Future episode right here. To, to. Yeah, <laughs> Grandpa Kaner and the Lone Kaner. That yeah. Yeah. oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but people tend to feel that way about it, right? They do happen to like both. But so I needed to understand because of my enthusiasm that this could not simply be another review, uh, you know, revisiting the so-and-so. If you remember last week, I was just writing revisiting the Stroh 160 because I had the review on hand and I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, it'd be nice. But it's not a key run by any chance. But I just revisited it and I thought it was nice because, again, it, it shared many of the things I wanted to talk about. But when I did the Eldorado 21, I was on a roll. I still remember how I felt that day. It was like I was on fire. I wrote that thing literally in 25 minutes and it got almost no editing whatsoever and that's very unusual for me um sometimes that's where the magic happens though right yeah <laughs> doesn't it yeah so i wrote about it and then i said okay enough this this there's more to this than just putting out a revisit and i said okay well what am i trying to do here so i came up with this idea of what i wanted i came up with the criteria that i wanted i, I realized that i wanted did not want to call it a classic or a great rum or anything like that it was mm -hmm. going to be the uh, you know what else memorable rums too long or should it be important rums? Yeah, too grandiose, but key rums. Key. Oh, yeah, I like that. that yeah. Yeah, because that encapsulates everything I wanted to say in a very short word that made sense to me. So I put it down there. And I. the next problem was the criteria, but that was easy enough because when you think about it, I'd already established them by just writing about these two rums. They've mm -hmm. got to be available to people. They've got to be... Uh, you know, just finding them in one little spot like Europe doesn't make it right. You know, people around the world have to agree on this kind of thing. And they've got to be affordable, mm -hmm. which basically puts some of these high price things out of the way immediately and stops this idea that it must be a classic of some kind. The hardest one is actually the question of approachability, which is edging over into almost a popularity contest. Right. Right. And but it's my job as a writer to convince you of the rightness of what I'm saying and why I think it should be judged on this. But to make it approachable means that people have tried it. People agree that it's good. And perhaps it's not at the top of their pantheon, but it's certainly not at the bottom either. And they understand where I'm coming from with this thing. So they know what it is that I'm talking about. Would, right. would you say so, pr approachable would be similar in terms of describing something as like a good entry point into a particular category? Yes, that's definitely a part of it. And let me give you an example. Uh, one of the most polarizing rums I've ever tried in my life was the Velier National Rum of Jamaica. You remember that f those four bottles that he put out about the, three, the, four years the ago? The Tekka and the... Uh -huh, and the tech, the tech and, is the one I'm thinking about yeah. because the Cambridge and the Vale Royale and the Tech B, they or the, the Tech C, sorry, those were all kind of okay. Yeah, no, you could certainly understand why they were as important as they were. But that tech, oh my God, that was just like effluent. <laughs> some damn, of some some of, some of the wackiest tasting notes from the review ecosystem come on tech reviews. Anytime I see one, I open it up just to see what people write down for it. So do I actually. <laughs> but you can understand why that is not approachable. Yes. It's too polarizing. People don't agree on this. They think it's crap or they think it's great, depending on where they stand. And that does not make it approachable. And you cannot tell somebody you got to try this if you want to get into jamaican rums no you right. can't you would tell them about the appleton yes, right or something exactly. else along that yeah. so i created the approachable rule and yes there's an element of popularity in it that is kind of unavailable that is uh, you know i can't get away from that but as i say it's my job to make sure i convince you of the rightness of my view on that it also has to be known people have to know about the rum it, it's pointless talking about some new thing that has just started being released 
yesterday morning and pretend that it's as important as you make it out to be. It's got to be around for a little while, a few years, perhaps. Mm -hmm. It's got to be known by people and come up in the literature, right? And that creates a serious issue for a number of people who have written to me dismissing the entire concept. Because if a rum is well known and comes up for discussion often, then that means you have to discuss sweetened rums. Right, right, right. And that doesn't sit well with a lot of people, right, who are very mm-hmm. vocal about their dismissal of rums of that nature. I would imagine I, you get a lot of people saying they should they, they should be exempted almost from being part of the conversation. Yes, but I don't agree with that. So yeah. and it's my list on my side, so I get a chance, you know. <laughs> I get to I get to make rules, that are my rules at any rate. Um, and if you'll if you'll notice, I I actually released the key rums review of the Diplomatica Reserva Exclusiva, for, you know, with a lot of nervousness. Mm-hmm. I really mm-hmm. agonized over that one. I mean, I I spent I think three four days writing that one right. just to make sure I tried to address every possible way people could say you don't know what you're talking about. This is crap. How could you include this on your list? Well, I had to make the case. Right. I like to think I did because that is actually one of the highest rated of the uh, of the series that I ever had. People love this stuff. Yeah. People really do. And that means you because it comes up in conversation, it must be addressed. And you know, I don't know if I'll ever go with something as really anno- that really pisses people off like the Don Papa series or the Bumbu for that matter. I mean, you put those up in a Facebook post and you can be guaranteed that the knives are gonna come out within yep. Five minutes. Dictador well, is another one that comes to mind. Mm-hmm. Right. But in Colombia, where Dictador comes from, uh, or in uh, other places that such sweetened drums sell gangbusters, I mean, they, they sell mm-hmm. and they, people buy them. And it's not because they don't know. They know. I have been told on so many occasions, you know, we are not stupid. We are not right. idiots. We know that this has sugar or we know this has been adulterated. We like it precisely because of that. Mm-hmm. And that meant that at some point, I, I doubt I'll, I'll do the boom, but I got to keep an open mind about it. You know, and there's so many candidates out there that I am not. I'm under no particular pressure to go controversial just for the sake of being controversial, you know, but at some point I think it's an important piece of work. I have to look at it, honestly, go and do the research and go back into it and say, okay, well, why is it important? Again, state the case. So all of these things, the longevity, the approachability, the affordability, the fact that people know about it, all these come together. Those are my criteria. And so far, I think only one rum missed it, missed that criteria. Can I guess which one? Please do. It, was it Rivers Antoine? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh, that was good. Well, yeah. Wow. Well, and I, I'm thinking it's it's uh, the availability, right? Because, it, but that it, is it changing. Was. That's yeah, starting to change. I was ahead of the curve on that one. <laughs> exactly. yeah. Yeah. Myself, Just you know? give yourself a pat on the back. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> But um, I had tried Rivers Antoine in Toronto. Oh, I can't remember when it was. Uh, 2011, maybe? 2010? I'd driven to Toronto from Calgary to see some friends of mine. And a guy called John, who is, I had good known name. from my Guyana days. <laughs> yeah, very good name. <laughs> he invited me to his house for dinner. And he had a whole bunch of older rums that I had never seen before. One of which was Rivers Antoine, which was white. And I tasted it and I liked it. And I, I never forgot it. But, of course, it's very limited edition it's very artisanal and only recently since Velia's cut a deal with them to our great benefit has it become more wide widely available yeah. and I'm, everybody who has had it has told me that oh my god this thing really is as good as the j ray and fu 63 the white overproof so mm-hmm. you know kudos to them i'm happy that i was able to write about it uh and tell people about its quality even though it failed one of the tests well i, and, I would encourage mm-hmm. people to go read that and we'll obviously put up links to all of these yeah. but you you speak to I, I, one of the things i love is you address that in the piece right you talk about why even though this doesn't necessarily meet some of my criteria here's why i think it's important um and that's yeah. one of the things you've touched on is um I, I love because anytime i write something or i'm getting ready to talk about something on the podcast i'll agonize about it for days just wanting to make sure i'm trying to cover every possible counter or whatever and it's yes. not in the interest of being right it's it's about wanting to make making sure i'm giving people the accurate representation of how mm-hmm. i feel and mm-hmm. it sounds yeah. like to me that that's exactly what, what you're talking about as well yeah and in point of fact i did have to change my cover page because i was 
asked about that it, literally within hours of the review going up. <laughs> mm. I was asked about it, and I looked at my criteria, and I added a little extra blurb, a get-out-of-jail-free card, which is <laughs> I don't like doing, but in this case, it really had to be done. And I said, okay, you know, the world doesn't play by my rules, and sometimes I will have to go away from these rules, but I will also have to justify why I do so, and I'd like to think that I've yeah. done so. Yeah. You can always count on the internet to check you, right? <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know that's that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a bad thing no. when it goes off the rails and people start cussing up and getting on and threatening your mommy or something yeah. like that. You yeah. know, but for the most part, good constructive criticism that is uh, doesn't seem to have an agenda but simply seeks to make your own work better. Mm. I find that extraordinarily useful. I find it a lot on Reddit, but uh, not so much on Facebook. And, but I, I think isn't that funny? Because yeah. I, I say the same thing, and it's so funny to me how the forum that is most people, I would say, are anonymous. There are some people who, you know, are, are open about who they are or whatever in real life. But yeah. just browsing through Reddit, you're not going to see someone's real name and know exactly who they are most of the time. And yet, no. that's where I feel people are more gracious, more uh, less less uh, argumentative, yeah, less yeah, yeah. Combat, less combative. Argumentative, that's right. Sure. Yeah. Then then somewhere like Facebook, where you know you've got your real name, you've got a picture with you and your kids together, and you're this angry person screaming <laughs> at everyone. I just don't. I don't there understand is a disconnect it. there. Yeah, yeah, that is interesting. Maybe it's the very anonymity that makes it easier to, you know, because remember, a lot of people get angry or as a defense mechanism to make sure that they don't get attacked in their turn. If you don't know who mm. they are, well, you that's can always true. delete the profile. Next, mm. you know, you're gone. Yeah. But uh, I do find that, generally speaking, I like the long-form format of Reddit. I think our room is particularly good for that. And then I kind of create a little subreddit of my own for, that, for that, those kind of conversations. And uh, yeah, no, I enjoy it. It's, it's, I like having it. It keeps you honest, and it must be done. Because you know, I was reading a political tract the other day, and uh, somebody wrote that dis- the dislike of a government for criticism is not a reason for censorship. It was actually, re- I thought it was a most perceptive comment, but the same goes for us as writers. Just mm. because somebody disagrees with us does not mean, A, that they're wrong, or B, that that's the reason to shut them down and attack them with every gun and call them an idiot. No, right. you've yeah. you got to give them credit for a little bit of intelligence, you know, yeah. because most of the time the points they raise are concerns that they themselves have. Sure. And those should be listened to unless they get stupid about it, in which case you can just withdraw, which is... Right. Usually the smart thing to do in that situation. Harder than you think. <laughs> <laughs> I, hate, I hate arguments that I can't win, but uh, I do have to learn the hard way that you got to have a thick skin to be on public in, in the public forum these days. If you don't yeah, have a thick true. skin, you can't take a little bit of back and forth, then you've got no business being there at all because you, your feelings will be hurt every yeah. day. <laughs> yeah. Lance, with the key rums list, before you move on, which of the selections were the most obvious ones to you so far? And and did you struggle with any of them? Or, or if so, which ones did you struggle with more? Oof. All right. Which ones were the easiest? Well, obviously, the first two, you know, they were self-explanatory. They had to be a part of it. Yeah. Uh, I knew, What I did, actually, is I thought about the countries in the Caribbean first and South America and wherever mm. else. And I said, okay, what would be a representative of each that I would think should make the, the first cut, the rough That's cut? That's funny, speak? yeah. I, right? I think so the same way, yeah. You come up with something. So they, certainly it was the Appleton, the Eldorado 15-year-old, the Diplo. I knew I was going to have to write about the Diplo sooner or later. Mm-hmm. Um, the, uh, let's see, which one was... Uh, the four square exceptional series were just starting to make big waves then, but I had a feeling sooner or later I'd want to write about one of them. Yeah. Um, it wasn't self-evident. The Mount Gay XO certainly pipped that one because I thought that really was much more emblematic of mm-hmm. Barbados than four square was. But, uh, well, I mean, anybody who sees the list knows that I kind of came around on that one too. I knew I had to go with an agricole. That was easy. Which one was the problem? Because my God, there's just so many of them, right? I mean, there's all right. these distilleries on these few islands. Uh, it's almost like Isla in um, mm-hmm. in Scotland. Scotch. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So easy was. I'm just going through the list in my mind now. So easy was the Appleton 12, the Eldorado 21, the Mount Gay XO, the Eldorado 15, the Diplo which I knew I would have to write about. I was on the fence about Grenada because I thought, no, is there anything from Clark's Court out there or mm. best of all that I could possibly... But then I said, no, this yeah. one's got to have it. I wanted to write about English Harbor in Antigua, but I wasn't sure which. St. Lucia, I still am on the fence about. I was just starting to research the, thir- the 1931 series to, for inclusion mm-hmm. as a series, mm-hmm. which because that was the one that first came to my mind. 
I that's interesting because just just looking at the the entries in the list beforehand, uh, I, I was already thinking to myself, I wonder when Saint. I I, I know Saint Lucia is obviously on your yeah. radar, but I was starting to think like, what which one belongs, you know? And it's 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 the thirty one is out of production now; it isn't being made. So all my ideas just went. <laughs> yeah. So if you about two years ago, I started writing about the first, second, third, and fourth release, which I had samples of, and I wrote about the, and I chucked them into the Romaniacs immediately. But that was the preliminary work that I had done on the 1931 series, right? It was for inclusion in the key rums, which I can no longer do because mm. now it's no longer commonly available. I'm sure you can still find it. But Wow, yeah. yeah, I hadn't heard that, that they had stopped the series. I knew that they were working on like a different blend of it as this iteration, but I hadn't heard that they had stopped the production of it now. Yeah, they folded it into the Forgotten Casks and some of the historical oh. marks that they're now putting out. Uh, I haven't mm. followed it up very closely, but I know that it stopped, which is kind of a shame. So mm. I thought about putting the Forgotten Casks in, but I haven't gotten around to it yet because I don't actually have a sample of it. Okay. And remember, okay. Mm-hmm. it's not enough for me to simply say it's there. I've got to have tried it. Right. And I can't do that right now because all my stuff is sitting down in uh, in Europe somewhere. So, okay, those are the easy ones, not a problem, but the hard ones. You'd be surprised, but one of the difficult ones was the J. Ray and Nephew white overproof. Really? really? I, thought, I thought that would have yeah, been yes, one of the, like, right yeah, away. I would have thought that was easy, too. Wait, because because so explain I, what's hard about it. Because I thought it was just another white crap rum that people used to drink with, right? Just a, just a basic Whoa. mixer. The internet's but, coming after you for that one, Lance. Be careful. That's okay. I don't know, but I did include it later. <laughs> so I kind of like, you know, dodged back and picked it up. But what happened was but when I, I, I happened to see a sample and I had just written two lists, 21 great whites. Mm. And then two years later, I wrote another one, 21 more great whites. Yeah, right. And by that time, I had done a full 180 minutes. I said, oh, my God, you know, there are so many great white rums out there. Yeah. They are incredibly good. They are flavorful. They can be mm-hmm. had any which way you want. And they are so intertwined with the culture of their island or their land right. or their that you simply cannot pretend that just because – you know, they are cheap mixers. You can ignore them. And then I said, yeah, you know, buddy, you got to go back to that JRA, man. So I picked up a sample and I reviewed it and it really was fun to do. And I realized how totally wrong I was. I was hmm. happy to write it and include it in the Pantheon. But I did have my initial issues with it in 2017 when I was putting together my initial list of candidates. And the Appleton, of course, did win yeah. out. And there will be others in times to come. Yeah, I yeah, just love you. that you call it a pantheon. That 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 like warms my heart as a as a former classics major as well. <laughs> That's so uh, that is the right word for it though. I mean, we call it the key runs of the series, but I agree it's kind of like a pantheon. Uh it makes sense and uh, you can point to it and say, you know, if yeah. you want to know what to start with or to populate your first bar with, here you go. There's some stuff you can start with, and that's well, good enough for me. And we yeah. did an episode uh, maybe a couple months back uh, where a listener had written in, and, and you know, they, they they tried some of those first, you know, rums that get recommended a lot. You know, the, the Appleton 12, they, they right. bought an exceptional cask series release, probably like Dooley's or something like that. And they're like, what should I try next? And so we did an episode, you know, what, what should you try next if you're new? And mm-hmm. one of the rums that I included was Ray and Nephew Overproof, because I think a lot of new comers into rum they they kind of skip past it now almost right they, yes. they get you know the kind of age stuff and maybe they have um you know an unaged or a white rum for for making daiquiris with or whatever but they just kind of skip past it and and we had a listener write back in recently and mentioned that he went back and he got the ray nephew overproof and he was just amazed at how wonderful it was yeah. um and I, I it warmed my heart to see that because yeah. i think it's it's true and it, it's such a cultural touchstone of where it comes from right um and like but, but yet anathema to everything whiskey in a way right which is why i think a lot of people coming from whiskey into rum then oh they skip right over it which we, we we've already talked about this too will we spend our time talking about it but yeah i, I agree completely that it, it it does get passed over for those reasons and the reasons that lance brought up yeah the same with you know some of the the way that the bottle it doesn't look presents fancy itself. Yeah. right no. yeah we no, t- john and i john it, and i have arguments over fancy yeah, bottles t- a lot we're still kind of arguing take a look at the uh, st james pot still white Mm. You know, that was a cool dish off. Oh, my God. When I got that to try, I could not believe it. You know, here's an agricole maker making a rum like this from a pot still. Oh, my Lord. It was so good. You know, and there's lots more like that. So anybody, you know, this is something I wanted to bring up at some later point in the discussion. But since we're here, I just think that pot still whites or, um, you know, high flavored whites that are unaged have a lot to offer people, even those who don't think that they should be anywhere except the bottom of the heap. Because you tend to think in terms of ages, right? Yeah, right. 
five year old, ten year old, twelve, or whatever, and then you go up the scale, and of course, anything that's like fifty years old is like you know Christ's own tears. But <laughs> the fact of the matter is, is that the unaged rums that are white and and made on a Creole column still or a pot still are so incredibly tasty that it sometimes seems almost a, cr- a crime to mix them. Although, of course, that's what they're used for, but they yeah. have that disreputability mm-hmm. attached to them that I think we we have to get away from. And part of right. including them in series like this is to make sure that people understand that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and one, one thing you touched on that, that I, I love talking about, and John and I talk about it a lot, is coming back to a rum that you haven't had in a while and seeing how your thoughts and impressions of it evolve over time. Sometimes they get better, sometimes they get worse, sometimes they stay the same, but it's always mm-hmm. kind of an interesting exercise. And it's one of the aspects of the series that I really enjoy is when you, you, you know, you, you review something that you had years and years ago, but you hadn't come back to in a while. Um, can you recall which rums your thoughts shifted on the most when you went back to them for the series and, and which ones, you know, maybe stayed the same the most? Were there any in particular that just like, wow, wow complete 180 from the last time I had this? Uh, the Dorleys. Dorleys. For sure, the Dorleys. Which um, way? Just in terms of you thought it was amazing and now it's just okay or, or the opposite? The opposite. So you thought it was okay, and now you think it's amazing? Richard's going to listen to this, and he's going to say, you bastard. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so let me give you some backstory here. Um, Anybody who's read the reviews that I've written of Barbados rums in particular would understand that I don't necessarily think they're as unique as others do. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not that I'm indifferent to them. I just don't think they're that special. They're not your favorite. No, they're not. They, They lack that individuality I like so much. Mm -hmm. So with the Dorleys, which I'd reviewed before, um, and I've gone through Dorleys on several occasions, more than, you know, more than just a quick retaste and, okay, here's my new opinion. No, I've I've really tried my best to understand what makes this thing so perennially popular, Mm -hmm. always comes up on lists, always as a rum to start with, always noted as a gateway rum. It lacks the cachet of the uh, exceptional cast series, but yet it's always there. And I needed to understand that. And then I realized that the very same things that I thought were its to its detriment were actually its strengths. It wasn't particularly exceptional, but it was good. Yeah. It was well made. Mm. It satisfies. It's at a very affordable price. Yes. You know, it has that status about it that comes from being made for such a long time that has got Richard Seale's name behind it with Foursquare behind it. You know, the 14 year old is a new one that has recently come out in the last year or two. Yeah. And I haven't had a chance to try it. I've heard it's quite good. And the RLC, I think, is is it a 12 year old now? Uh, There's a 10 and a 12 now. Yeah. Okay. Um, those are good, but for some reason, it's the Dorleys that I keep focusing on uh, because they have more of a range there. And I said, okay, you know what? Just because it doesn't press all my buttons doesn't mean it's a bad rum by any stretch of the imagination. I've got to be able to say that. So even though it'll never be one of my favorite rums, it is still a key rum of the world. It must be acknowledged as such. It sells gangbusters all the time. It lends luster to the name of Foursquare, and yeah. it'll never be out of print, so to speak, or out of production. I think it. it you know the blend might change over time, sure. But it's mm-hmm. just it's just a very good serviceable rum, and if that is the definition of a key rum, well, I've been making a mistake this whole time, <laughs> you know. So I certainly I, I I wouldn't say I went to hundred and eight on it, but yeah. I certainly did change my opinion on what initially I thought was bad points. You know, they no, they actually aren't. They're actually good points, and to mm. some extent, the Santa Teresa seventeen ninety six was like that too, mm. because. Again, like the Diplo, it kind of got a bad rep for having some sweetening, although not as much as people seem to think it is. I had liked it back in the day when I first looked at it in 2010 or 2011, Mm -hmm. but I went back to it again, and I was actually quite surprised. For a 40% rum to hold its own against a guy like me who likes individualistic taste, doesn't like Latin rums that much, and who thinks that, you know, undifferentiated blah is just like a crime against humanity. No, 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 no. For that to still impress me is quite an achievement. I had such a similar journey with that rum that that (laughs) we documented on the podcast. Um, The first time I had it, because I, I didn't have it at the beginning of my journey into rum, as many people do, I had it later on. And so when I had it, I was, I tasted, what's what's the big deal about this? Why should I care about this at all? But sometimes it's about 
you have to go back to, but wait a second, so many people like this. It is it is appealing for some reason. It always comes up. Why is that? And when you go back to it with that mindset, um, it's kind of like you were talking about with Dorley's 12. You, you, you notice different things about it. And I came to appreciate it a little bit more than, than I did initially. So, yeah, um, yeah, that's exactly what, that's exactly what I felt about it. And I, you, you know, you, you got to give these rum makers credit just because the echo chamber of the Facebook clubs always goes after anybody who makes professors a liking for these things doesn't mean that they're not popular. I mean, let's be, let's be clear. We like to call ourselves influencers, but Bacardi doesn't tremble when we write. DDL could give a damn what we <laughs> right. say about them and their sweetened drums. They stopped sweetening their drums from 2004, and we only started to see that now. But it wasn't because we started talking about it. It's because they made that decision without us. Yeah. Right? And, you know, there might be 10 different kinds of hate against plantation. You think they give a damn? No, they're selling gangbusters around the world. They're not going out of business anytime soon. I'm sorry, but that's just the facts of life. So just because we say so and we hear all these people repeat it to us does not necessarily mean it's right. And we have to exercise a certain critical thinking faculty of our own to decide for ourselves, is this correct? And the only way to do that is to try the damn thing, which is why it's one of my inviolable rules that even though I've got like 10, 15 more candidates in my mind going forward, until Mm -hmm. I actually taste them, I will not write about them. I can't because that would be unfair. You know, what do I really think about? Right. And that goes back to your comment about changing one's perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So are there rums out there that you're considering because of whatever reason you may not have had to try them yet? And I understand that that's a you have to do that. But that you see as a product that is growing in reputation or that something is there that you see in the next five years or so, it maybe could be a key rum. Maybe it's not yet, but but it's on its way. Boy, that that's a tough one. Um, Yes. Yes. Because I was going to say you can say no, but I like yes better. <laughs> no, no absolutely. I, I'll, I'll say yes. And um, without going into specifics, they've got to be, uh, they will be from other than the current Caribbean fixation, mm-hmm. right? So, mm-hmm. okay, so let me, let me give you some, one of the questions that I know that I wanted to talk about was the challenge of picking anything, yeah. right? Yeah. And the hardest one is when you've got a very large country. So the United States, as we talked about earlier, has 400 plus distilleries, and that's probably undercounting them. You know, more like six. Know, I say six now. <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> and we know that they tend to do they they multitask like a son of a yep. bitch, right? I mean, they just do everything, and to their detriment, I think. Yeah. Uh, but they, yeah, I, I like to say this- I like to say you have a small number of rum distilleries, and you have a large number of distilleries that make rum. Mm-hmm. That's the distinct the mm-hmm. distinction. I mean, makes. that's brilliant. That's absolutely true. Oh well, thank right? you. Right, <laughs> <laughs> you hit it. Um, so, how do you pick one, the first one, from a country as large as the United States? How do you pick a single cachaça from Brazil? Brazil yeah. When yeah. I've heard there's many as four to thousand. I mean, I keep, the number keeps changing, but you know, I love that number, four to thousand. So, hell, well, you're you, gonna could, pick one. you could do the same thing with Clarin and Haiti. I was going to say the same. Damn, you beat me to it, Will. <laughs> Sorry, John. I was thinking the exact same thing. Yeah, yes. not a huge. Uh, Country, uh, but the the difference between those different distilleries that are you know tens of miles away is tremendous. It absolutely it, it really is. Sometimes, if you're lucky, you can pick one that's representative of the set. Mm. But you can't always do that, right? Yeah. Um, so, for example, uh, the Clarence is a good example, right? I mean, if I was going to write about the Clarence, I'd probably say, okay, let's talk about the Vaval or let's talk about the Saju. Saju, yeah, yeah. You'd pick one from that series of, of Velier releases because I feel like those are the ones that really put it on people's radar in the first place. They're the ones that get talked about the most. Um, yeah. But that's not always and the Velier case also- with the other places. No, but there are other Clarence out there that are Definitely. commercially made but only sold within... Haiti itself that we never right. hear about. Exactly. Right? right. They just, I think one of the reasons why Velier picked the four, five that it did was because they followed very strict protocols that were set up, right? Ones that don't, don't get to be part of the Velier pantheon, but that's a separate issue entirely. But I would probably pick one because there's just so few commercially available that you could pick one and that can be representative mm. of the class. You can make your remarks around that. But to uh, get back to your question, John, the I know I want to talk about uh, some of the Asian rums I've spoken to in the past, right? So, so not maybe not soon because of course we're still under lockdown. We, rum fests are closed. I can't get the samples I want or the bottles that I want. So you know it would be no surprise to know that uh, the the small little micros from uh, Laos or Cambodia or Vietnam mm-hmm. are going to come in for mention. I've got to pick one from Japan sooner or later, right? 
Do you I'd consider to... Okinawan rums also Japanese in that category, or is that yes. slightly crowbarred there? Okay. No. It would be like this differentiating between Mariga Lant and Guadeloupe. It'd be yeah. Yeah. that kind of thing, right? So okay. for me, let's just... Let's not get too much into the weeds, and I, I would consider them Japanese for now. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd love to know more about Australian rums. I'm going to have to address that sooner or later. Yeah. It may be later rather than sooner. Uh, I have no idea what to do with that. And, right? and I, th- That's a good point that, that relates to something you mentioned earlier when you were talking about how many areas of the world are still un, you know, not really documented. Um, and you mentioned how the United States, you know, between the burrs, between my website and everything um, is helping with that. But I feel the same way when I look at like Australia, because also, you know, I, I have alerts set up to get emails about articles that mention new distilleries and stuff. And just like with the United States having this craft distillery movement over the last couple of decades, you're mm-hmm. seeing it play out in other places too. So many new small distilleries opening in places like Australia, even in Europe now. We're seeing more, I want to say, yeah. almost almost every UK month or so, you're seeing another distillery making rum in Europe now. So there, there's all these all these places over the world where this kind of phenomenon is, is occurring. From my perspective, the problem I have is, uh, aside from access, right, is that there's a lack of information out there that I can consult to yeah. say whether something is popular or not. And let's just take Australia again. Like everybody knows about Bundaberg and everybody now slowly is beginning to know much more about Beanley. Yeah. But there's more than that. Mm-hmm. Much more. Yeah. Except that we don't know anything about it. Now, I thought Tatu Carlos, who ran that uh, one of the earliest rum reviewing site called Refined Vices or back in, I think he started in 2007 or something like that. He was definitely one of the first. Right. He moved to Australia. And he was going great guns there, but then he went dark for a while. Mm. And uh, now he's working for Velier, and I think he probably feels that, you know, it would be a conflict of interest to to write about uh, stuff that when he's repping yet another sure. brand, so he doesn't. But I was hoping that there would be some reviewers out there who from Australia who would start this the ball rolling, but doesn't seem to be happening and we just don't get enough of otherwise so that's part of the issue that I have in putting together names of new rums to try. But I have my list in my head. I've given you some you know, hints as to what I'm thinking about sure. in terms of where yeah. I want to go in the future. I'm just waiting for the world to open. And once that happens, you know, I can actually get the samples because I can write a lot of the information ahead of time. I can write about the history. I can write about my rationale. I can refer to other people's work to say why I think it's important and what people are saying and how that justifies my decision. But without tasting notes, it's not going to print. Not now, not ever. Mm-hmm. It can't. You know, one of the things we've talked about before and touched on in, in various ways throughout this is is how quickly we move on from one thing to the next. Uh, you know, nowadays. <laughs> Don't be just. To sound, to sound like an old person, I can't believe I said nowadays. Ah, on the program. In my time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Back in my day. Uh, and, and, you know, things get forgotten quickly. And I think this series speaks to capturing, you know, the things that are important, but that don't get discussed as much because of that tendency to look at the next new, interesting, different thing that's coming out all the time. Um, mm-hmm. and, and that's one of the things I like about the Lone Caners. I feel like you have this sort of repository, not of just reviews and releases, but context around all of the companies and people associated with the rums you review. Is that something that you notice too? And, and is that something you're intentionally trying to not push back against necessarily, but just to slow things down and like capture things in the moment so they don't just, you know, pass by and are forgotten in a blink like so much stuff is now? Yes, absolutely. Um, what happens is that I've more and more, I think that the argument, I've been told, don't get involved in an argument today because tomorrow it's going to be gone. Well, it's absolutely true. You mm-hmm. could think about a particular discussion on uh, about Foursquare and the GI, and people would just hate you today. But tomorrow they're going to be like your best friends all over again because they forgot what happened yesterday, you know. But more than that, when I, I was doing the preliminary work for the Velier essay, the mm-hmm. Age of Velier's Demararas, it was astonishing how difficult it was to get any kind of perspective on the rums that were available, what was popular, what was the issues of the day all within the lifetime of people now living. Yeah. So to do anything about pre-1990 was a practical impossibility. Post-1990 was a bit easier, but I couldn't get a response from DDL. For example, why did they pick 1992 to issue the 15-year-old, right? Which was a seminal rum of its time, I thought, because the first time you got a rum that good, that cheap, issued in tens of thousands of bottles around the world. I mean, that really did Mm -hmm. the world too, which is one reason why it's a key rum. But... um, That extends to a lot of other things. Now, I I want to give you a very specific example. About three weeks ago, I was writing about a Cadenhead 
that mm-hmm. was issued 2000? I can't remember. Whatever. It was a very recent one. It was a 13-year-old, apparently, according to the scribbled notation on the sample. <laughs> there was nothing available on this from anywhere on the, on the web. Uh-huh. Literally nowhere. I called Cadenhead. You know, I have a subscription to several online digital archives of newspapers and magazines yes. and whatnot because I need to do this, right? That had nothing. You know, to use the rather dismissive comment of a gentleman uh, just a few, a week or two ago, you know, I used Google to find out what I wanted because mm-hmm. that's all I had available. In all the research that I did with the Cadenhead shops, the Cadenhead website, the phone calls I made, the emails I sent out, and everything else, digital or otherwise, repository, archive, you name it, there was exactly one reference to that room. Wow. One. And Where this was, was a room that was issued within this century. So it was 2000. Yeah, it was actually a 2000 room. A Cadenhead. That was an auction from an Austrian website that specialized in drinks. And all it had was Cadenhead 73.6%. 2000. That's it. That's all it said on how much it cost. <laughs> Very informative for you. <laughs> so finally, I, I did get a photograph of the label and I was able to write my review on that basis. But it scared the hell out of me because, like, I mean, if this if stuff so recent could go out of, out, of, out of print and out of knowledge, what must be happening to stuff that we think is everybody knows about, but nobody actually does? Another good example was when I wrote the biography of this Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. Mm. Now, that started in 1983. They started issuing rums, ooh, I don't know. Uh, 20, 2008, 2010, something like that. But I reached out to them because they were very friendly. They helped me a lot in my research. They gave me some, uh, some background material. And I said, okay, here's the list of everything that I know that you guys have done. Right? Can you fill in the blanks of all the earlier stuff that I'm missing? What are the names? What are the strengths? You know, and so on. The guy looked at it. Damn, your list is better than ours. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like what are you kidding me you know and this is something that i see happening over and over again in my researches of the romaniacs and everywhere else it's just like common knowledge that we think is common isn't we are losing it because nobody thinks to record this stuff carl canto who used to be uh, a big wheel in demerara distillers limited before his retirement you know he mourned to me that all these bottles and labels and uh, expressions and changes and blends nobody ever recorded any of this so it's all gone it's 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 history isn't that so odd though that it feels like it's easier now than ever before to record information and yeah, but, <laughs> and yeah and what happens because of that nobody does yeah maybe right. so, so. To some extent, so one of the things in my, I think you've commented on in my reviews is how much information I try to put in there. It's not just in the Romaniac series or in the key rum series, but also in the standard. If nothing has been written about the distillery by me or anybody else for that matter, you know, I try to do as much research. I call them, I email them, I try to get information, and sometimes they respond, most of the times they don't. You know, but I put all available info in one place. A good example is the Rockley Still. I wrote about a Rockley Still style rum not too long ago, mm-hmm. and... I looked and it's like the, the information was all contradictory. So I got on to, uh, to Richard. I talked to, I looked at the websites that uh, had, uh, and I consolidated it all. I created nothing new. All I did was consolidate in one place all the information over time that had been written about this and said, this is where you can find it and this is where I got it, but this is what it is. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, I got the seal of approval. The man said, yep, I think you covered it all. You know, I mean, that was like, what more really can you ask moment. for? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So I think it's necessary and I think it's ignored at our peril because remember, you know, that we are all old farts in waiting. In 20 years, we're going to be gone from this gig. We're not going to be doing this anymore. We will have lost interest or we're going to be drinking scotch or I don't know what we're going to be doing, but some of us might just pass on, you know, but this whole generation of writers is going to go, and if nobody's there to replace it, and we leave no history behind to say, this is what it was, Mm -hmm. then the next generation of people who are going to be wanting to know, because remember, all the rums that are being made now are tomorrow's classics, right? Right, That people are writing about. Exactly. Nobody's going to know anything about this stuff, and they're going to go through the same crap that I go through and that Wes and uh, Steve and all these other guys go through. There's just nothing available. I don't agree that everything is online. I think there's enough offline for you to make a good thing, which is why I subscribe to the, uh, to the services that I do. Mm-hmm. But even that sometimes isn't enough. I mean, I want to write about Flensburg. In, have you ever heard about Flensburg? It's a town in the north of Germany that used to be Danish. Huge rum emporium. The amount really? of companies making rum there in the 19th and early 20th century is freaking unbelievable. You no. never heard about it. No, Why? I haven't. Because nobody's no. ever written about it. Yeah. Right? I want to, but I realized when I was doing my preliminary research into the matter, 
I have to go there. This is one place I really have to go to, right? And um, of course, the pandemic kind of like screwed my plans there because I was planning to do it uh, mm-hmm. on my very next visit to Germany. Because well, you, you, you're a regular at the Berlin Rum Festival, right? Yeah, my mom lives there, so I get free. I get oh, free great. accommodation. Yeah, precious. She stores my rums. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, thanks, mom. Your basement is full. <laughs> yeah, thanks, mom. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> you know. um, she she stores all my rums in her basement, and I bring them up every time the the guys come over. You know, so I have a new set. There's just so much there, but. I need to be able to go to Flensburg to, to do that proper research and talk to people who are still in the houses of the companies that like Deathlifson and uh, oh, Thiessen. Oh my God, there's just like so many of them. It, mm-hmm. it really is quite incredible. Hmm. And I can't do it through the internet. There's some information to get me started, not enough to finish it off. And I don't want that to happen with our society now. You right. know, when Luca and Steve Remsberg and Alex Gabriel and Richard C. and these great historians of our time who actually are so interested in this stuff, who collect this stuff, when they pass on, if they don't leave this in some format that people can access, we're screwed. Right. All of this is gone. You know, I don't want to see that. I, I just think it's wrong i think we should provide that context with what we do so that's why i enjoy it and do it so much Mm -hmm. one thing that's occurring to me throughout all this is how how passionate you are about this and how much work you put into it and this is not what you do for a living obviously um it's no it isn't a passion on the side is there is there any answer beyond just like I love doing this and I'm passionate about it as to what pushes you to feel like an urgency to try to preserve this information. Like how do do you explain all the time you put into this when people ask about it? Uh, Nobody actually asks. (laughs) (laughs) Well, those are the best questions. Those are the best questions for the show. So I'm I'm glad it came Uh, up. I am obsessive about things that I like. Mm -hmm. Um, I've had various interests in my life. I mean, I still, uh, I love photography. Oh really? Um, I la- I love you do writing, take great honestly. photos for the the site, by the way, or whoever takes the photos. Mm-hmm. They're always very nice. Uh, they're they're all mine. When, when my uh, the you know copyright information is at the bottom, it's mine. When okay. it's not, then it's been taken from somewhere. I try to give credit where when I've t- pinched it from somebody. Sure, it's from I Grandpa Kaner, right? Or Mama Kaner? <laughs> yeah, right. Or you know, courtesy of Will Herkinger, but taken without his permission, or pinched from John Guller's site. You know, he doesn't know, but I took it. You know, something like that. Um, but I've liked writing since I was a kid. Yeah. I've been writing short stories and little things, and you know, it, it helped me navigate some very confusing times in my childhood. Uh, and my young manhood, because, you know, it was a weird way to grow up the way I did. And it somehow, I didn't, I, I just couldn't make it as a short story writer or as a novelist or anything like that. And I, believe me, I tried. You know, there's just <laughs> oh, execrable crap. But uh, I like, I seem to have found a meteor in being able to write essays, mm. short, crisp, snappy essays that provide the information and also my love of language. Yeah. I speak six languages. Yes. I was going to, when you were talking I, about I, Germany, yes. I was going to ask, do you speak German? And then I was like, well, how many country, how many languages do you speak? So it's six. I, I speak three fluently, Russian, German, and English. Wow. Right. That That's is amazing. And uh, I've, I've got a really good handle on uh, Kyrgyz and Kazakh. Uh, a little bit. Of sp- I can I can get by in Spanish if I have to because I used okay. to work on the Venezuelan border areas where I, I picked up a good bit, right? And uh, I think my French has just gone now. It used to be okay, but now it's. I found on my last visit to France. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's toast. You know, but I can get by in the ones that I've mentioned. So it's really quite useful. Yeah. But one thing that it taught me was how beautiful a language English actually is. Um, yeah. I can really I can really push the language around a lot. Actually, I wanted to bring that up because I'm glad you brought up about your love of language because the one thing to me that has always brought me back to your site many times over is this this sort of approach to it that doesn't just it's not about just tasting notes and nosing notes and background information. You do have that, but Beyond that, there it's a pleasurable read on a topic that I love reading about, and it's done skillfully as a as a person you can tell that loves language, which I, I am one of those as well, and I think Will and I have discussed this too. We both are lovers of Good. language uh, in our own, or philologists, as you might say. <laughs> 
that's that's the thing to me that has always separated you from other reviews on there. We talked about them. They have their uses, but they can be clinical or sterile in their own approaches. This is a rum from Barbados. Yes. This is a rum from Square Square. Four Square is in St. Philip. Oh, for God's yeah. sake. Come on, you can do better. <laughs> Anybody can do better. I mean, I'd be pushed out of my English class for writing crap like that. And yet it happens all too often. I don't like it. I think yeah. you can do better. And why don't you? You know, it makes it readable. Is that your guiding light? Kind of like, you know, we can do better and I'm showing how that can happen? Or what, what, are, what has been your philosophy along with using that love of language? It must move me. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah. again, if you, I, I always come back to a few, you know, I should really start a, uh, a little sub-series called the key reviews that are my favorites. <laughs> you should. Um, <laughs> there's, there, there are some reviews that simply move me very deeply because of the way I felt when I wrote them. Hmm. Uh, the Mauritius 2008 that I tried, uh, that 1423 made, that I tried in Paris with my wife in the Maria Loca bar in, 20, uh, I think it was 2019, you know, 3,000 word essay. It was everything I felt, the good humor, my love for my wife, uh, my love for the people that were there, my friendship with so many impressive people in the, in the rum world. And then there was the um, El Dorado 21-year-old where yeah. I wrote, you know, that it, the rum fills me with sadness because it reminds me of a time when I was more easily satisfied, where I was younger, I was pleased with less. And now I've realized that wisdom came with that age. And I mean, mm-hmm. it's it's kind of like an elegy for the way we used to be when we were younger and realized that, you know what, with all this knowledge we have, all this expertise we gain, we do actually do something too. Stuff like that, I think, is philosophical, philological, take your pick on the term you want to use. But, you know, you can be funny too, right? Because the Bacardi 151 review that I wrote was was one of the first ones that, you know, I I wrote in that one (laughs) that, you know, it... Bacardi, issue, Bacardi uh, ages this in uh, wooden casks for two years, but you know it's a 151, and it really doesn't matter what kind of cask they issue it, because they could age it in my son's potty with a diaper floating in it, and tomorrow morning, they both potty and diaper would be gone. You know, I mean, like, <laughs> what on earth does that have to do with anything? But it tells you a lot about, you know, you can use language creatively to create a more interesting review that catches Absolutely. people's attention. Or, or, for example, the biblical flavor of the Eldorado 1980 to six 25 year old where i said and the caner went wrong <laughs> into battle with a sly serpent of sugar yeah i was just like what <laughs> i just so enjoyed that you know so it doesn't always have to be sad it can be funny it can be apropos it can be angry yeah. you can write stuff that's angry yeah if your emotions and your intellect are both engaged simultaneously you can write a better review and i told chip dixter that once when he wrote a particularly nice review that spoke about why this particular whiskey i think it was was so much why he liked it so much because it recalled to him the time of his youth in alberta and i said this is brilliant this is great this is why you should write more like this but yeah, of course right. he never did mm-hmm. and uh, it's all part and parcel to me of making it more interesting than simply just being an accountant and doing dry notes. I get enough of that crap at my, at my regular day job. <laughs> I don't need to bring it into my personal affairs and my personal writing. I want to push it. Yeah. I love that. And I think it speaks to so much of why people like us get drawn into rum in the first place, because you, you can talk about, well, we like it because it tastes good. Sure, definitely. But there's, there's so much more to it. And I think mm-hmm. the way... Uh, how you feel about something, what's going on in your life, whatever, can get packaged and associated with the taste of something, you know, um, to where they're yes. just married. Chappies actually have a term for it that they're certain, I, I can't remember what it, what the term actually, what the word is, but they speak about the sensory impressions that evoke strong memories. Yeah. And I'm a firm believer in that, and I absolutely agree. Yeah. Definitely. And some rums do that, right? Where you tasted mm-hmm. them, under what circumstances, who was with you? Mm-hmm. Like, I, I guarantee you that if any reviewer was to have an incredibly mediocre rum in the company of his best friends when they're celebrating an incredible achievement, their yeah. review would be different than when they had it in some sterile environment with nobody around where it's just like, yeah, okay, this is okay, you know, 75 points. <laughs> right. You know, no, it's, <laughs> and it tells a better story too, right? It's absolutely I mean, yeah. like that. Yeah. Yep. You know, one one more thing I wanted to to touch on. We talk so much about transparency on the production side of things with brands having a duty to be transparent about how their products are made. Um, but you brought up to me, you know, how important you think it is for the the promoters, the commentators, writers, reviewers, bloggers, whatever you want to say, to be kind of transparent about their affiliations. And I think oh, all, yeah. all consumers would agree with that. And it's it's clear 
uh, the conversation with you, you know, you've put a lot of thought into this with, you know, your, your policy on whether you accept, you know, free samples and things like that. This is something you thought about. And I'm curious just to kind of ask if, if there are any aspects of this right now that you see as being particularly problematic in the rum world or, and, and how you oh, think things like yeah. this can be rectified. I'm a firm believer in full disclosure, Yeah. right? Since I know that 90% of everything that I write about has been bought by me or gotten at a rum fest or so on, right? What I tend to do is to simply say thank you to those people who have actually supplied a sample because mm-hmm. I usually trade with a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, after a year, two years of not being in Germany, I know there's a, there's a whole lot over there waiting for me. And I can't always remember whether I paid for the sample, exchanged it or whatever, but I get them and I'll review them and I'll thank whoever it was who sent them so that the consumer can know where it was that I got it. Now, one thing that I found is becoming more prevalent is how this business of free samples has disappeared from popular disclosure. Now, if you're, I don't know how far back your memory goes on these things, but Chip Dixtra, who ran the Rumhauler blog, right? He is known for writing about samples that he has gotten from producers, mm. right? And for a while there, uh, Sir Scrotimus the Greater in Retirement Land was... <laughs> I was hoping giving, Sir Scrotimus giving... would come up at some point, just because oh, yeah. it's Sir one Scrot- of my anytime. favorite nicknames this... <laughs> of the rum universe. <laughs> it goes back to your love of language, probably. It does indeed. It does indeed. <laughs> yeah. Bad Latin, what can I tell you? But uh, Sir Scrotimus tore him a new backside just about every single time you wrote something, uh, because he said that, you know how can you trust something that you got for free? Mm. How can you, you know, and if it's all you get, then, you know, your reviews can never be bad because you want to make sure that the pipeline doesn't dry up. And of course, there have been several bloggers who have written essays on this subject and have decried the same practice and says, no, 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 you, you know, disclosure must be the first thing. Except that you'd notice a curious drying up of this kind of disclosure happening over the last three to four years. And, um, what has happened is that I know that there's one reviewer in particular who doesn't bother mentioning it at all. There's another one who has an affiliate with a brand whose stuff he reviews. And he says he got, he, he tends to say he has a free sample coming through the door, but he doesn't say that he's got a stake in the company that makes it either. Okay. The Masters of Malt, when they put out the Cornelius Ample Fourth Rum a few years ago, you know, and I reviewed it. It's actually a spice rum, which I didn't know at the time. But when I started looking into the, uh, the site, I mean, there were all these people who were saying such nice things about the rum. And then afterwards I realized that, uh, well, actually, hang on a second, these guys actually work for Atom Brands and Atom Brands owns Master of Malt. So they're really employees doing their own thing. Where's right. the disclosure there? So it's not just the writers, but I want to be careful about reviewers because it's a tough gig. It's hard to do. And for, you know, take some of the new blood who's now coming, these young bartenders who are so enthusiastic, providing so much invaluable content to everybody. You know, these guys don't have any money. You know, and if they get a free sample, then hell, I won't tell them to say no and don't take it and, you know, be purer than Caesar's wife. Not at all. (laughs) Two things I demand, though, right? Don't get up on your pulpit and demand everybody else do it when you don't and just disclose it. The consumer is helped by this. It takes no skin off your nose to say it. Mm -hmm. Why do people seem to think that somehow it's okay to remain silent because I can be trusted. I am honest. I am, you know, I have integrity. Well, the moment any reviewer starts putting that down on the paper, it's like Wes Bergen said in one of his essays, yeah, I think you protest too much and I instantly disbelieve it. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with him on this one. You know, you have to declare where your freebies come from. You must, because consumers' appreciation of your value as an independent, non-biased source that is not in thrall to a producer of any kind, or even a distributor for that matter. I think that goes for distributors as much as the producers, right? For a supposedly independent reviewer, you have to say that you got a free sample. Again, I don't see what the problem is. Why is it such a difficulty? Because it somehow impacts your integrity or people won't believe you anymore? Nonsense. Of course they will, right? So what they demand of others, they should absolutely obey themselves. You can't just get on your soapbox and start talking about other people's weaknesses without addressing, as we like to say in the Bible, you know, the moat in thy own. You know, I think that's just, that's just perfectly fair. But it goes a little bit further than that because forget the writers for the moment, Right, I've talked about this before, but it's subtler because now what we have is a lot of commentators on Facebook Mm -hmm. who basically never show either in their profiles or in their statements that they themselves have an affiliation of some kind with Mm. the commercial superstructure, which is in the most part. Mm -hmm. Right. And that is particularly insidious because I'll give you a concrete example without naming any names. About three months ago, perhaps, maybe four, 
a guy asked an innocent question on one of the, the rum clubs. Uh, so here's the 1796 Santa Teresa. What can you tell me about it? And there was this dismissive comment over there immediately, like literally within five minutes saying, yeah, it's too sweet. Right. And that sounds really innocent, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. it takes on a completely different tenor when you realize that in our little world, when you say something is too sweet, you're basically damning it to perdition right, right. forever. <laughs> Secondly, right. that the person making that comment was a represent a brand representative for a competing brand, which of course he never bothered to mention in his dismissive little comment there. Right, it's right. that kind of subtlety that I'm talking about that has to be addressed. And in point of fact, the German Rum Club, I think it was, they put a statement out about two, three months ago that says anybody who comments on this site in any way, positive or negative, about a rum and has an affiliation with the brand must state it or say it's an advertisement. Otherwise, we will delete your comment. Mm. And that mm. created instantly like about 100 very rancorous uh, posts backwards and forwards. But you don't I say. like the idea. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, one, one of the things I've, I've noticed going back to Reddit, one of the things that a lot of people who commentate regularly there do who are associated with the industry in some respect, they make it part of, I think it's called Flare on Reddit. It's like a little blurb next to your name. Um, Yeah, like moderator is for me on mine. Yeah, exactly. Um, But I know, you know, someone who works for, I I forget who it is, but someone who works for PM Spirits, which is an importer here in the United States, it says PM Spirits up by his name. There's someone who works for a particular uh, liquor store somewhere. It says the name of the liquor store by his name. I like that. Yeah, I like that too. Um, I think it's helpful and it's a way, it's a way for it to to contextualize comments from people, you know, because like like you were saying, that context changes the way you interpret something. And that is really important. But it also, so we got commentators, right, who like to, some of them who like to call themselves influencers, even though I think that they're dreaming when they call themselves <laughs> that, right? No, they, they really are. They, they think that they equate quantity with quality, and they think that because they comment constantly on everything, that they're actually saying something when actually the opposite is the case. Hmm. You know, they just, they're just tiresome, right? Which maybe me being bitchy, I don't know. Uh, I'd like to think not. <laughs> Right. But I think some amount of limit self limitation is a good thing, not a bad thing. You know, it makes the few things you do say that seem that much more important. Mm -hmm. But it's also the promoters themselves, right? The promoters are in a particularly delicate position because they're almost like intermediaries between producers and consumers. And promoters are particularly problematic when they start to opine on subjects in the rum, the the greater rumosphere. Because how can you believe somebody who has a vested interest in making the comment that he does, right? For example, you would never believe that anybody who works for Plantation could ever say anything bad about Plantation right. or, by contrast, anything good about Foursquare, yeah. right? And then you've got the opposite, which is that those commentators on Facebook who like to talk about uh, Foursquare is nothing but the – Foursquare is nothing but good, they – kind of like get identified with that in such a way that you never believe them when they say anything bad about anybody else. It destroys integrity in a way that I think is particularly dangerous because Mm -hmm. it stifles any kind of real debate when you don't know who you're talking to half the time. Right. And that's the great danger and the great benefit of social media is that you can get all this incredible variety of opinions, but then there are agendas behind all of that that you don't always know anything about. Right. It the takes a while I to can... catch on to all of those things if you're coming yeah, into it new. Exactly. Doesn't it get even muddier a little bit in the sense that all of what you're saying is correct and I agree. And at the same time, it doesn't necessitate that someone who has a connection with something is always at all times saying that comment with that in mind right but yet but yet we have to at least account for it in other words what i I guess what i'm trying to say is somebody has a connection to something doesn't mean that their opinion isn't their own or that they feel a certain way without thinking about that connection but without us knowing at the same time it just makes it really difficult for us to put anything into it yeah Absolutely. Yeah. I'll tell you I'll tell you one particular area where it absolutely destroyed my faith in a single writer. And this was a debate, not even a debate, it was a producer who started to get really angry about something. And the person he was getting angry about put a comment on Facebook asking a commentator, a writer, a reviewer, listen, you know this guy, can you tell him to just calm down? And the writer said, I don't have that kind of power. I literally, my my chin dropped on the floor the morning I read that comment. Because the writer had literally become a loudspeaker for the producer to such an extent that 
you know, he literally kind of like, you, you couldn't say anything bad about the guy without mm. this writer getting involved with it or commenting on it. And I think he became so identified all, as all pretense of objectivity in such a situation is lost and your mm. credibility is shot to shit. Sorry yeah. for the word, but it's, that's the only way I can express it. And I think that's dangerous for anybody who holds himself out to be a writer of any kind. You want to yeah. say you're objective? You want to say you're free and fair? Perfectly fine. Prove it. Be free and fair. Talk truth to power when it's needed. And I don't see that happening enough. And this is where your personal affiliations start to take on a greater importance. I, I personally agree with you, Will, or uh, sorry, John, that um, you don't, sometimes you really do express your personal opinion that has nothing to do with uh, your other affiliations, right? right? I just like the opinion as a consumer to know it. Right. And that doesn't happen often enough, unfortunately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the other huge gray area, we don't have to get too far into this for me, though, because we talked about writers and bloggers and reviewers and stuff. And I view that subset of people a little differently. Those are the people who are obsessed with rum, who are kind of doing this on their own. But then you have yeah. the larger publications, you know, that publish all these little lists, 20 best mm -hmm. rums or whatever, mm -hmm. and having yeah. any sort of window into how they selected those um, or how they tasted them or whatever, you get no transparency, 99 percent of the time and yet you see those shared so they're so prevalent uh they they get written about all the time i guess they are great at generating clicks or whatever i was gonna um, say they work yeah, yeah. yeah exactly um and, and yet there's 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 no transparency into how you know those were selected how they were tasted whether they're being paid to list some of those or, or whatever um and mm -hmm. i think that those are a, a big problem and i don't really know what the solution is other than to try to not pay them as much mind Yes and no. There, you know, it's, it's. I swear, this is so weird because one of the unpublished opinion pieces that I have that I keep polishing to this day is, you know, beware of lists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And top five reasons to beware of lists. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder how many people will get that joke. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, one of the things that I, I, I really made mention of in this is that it's pretty much the same thing you did. You don't know who made them. You don't know on what's, but the thing is they engage people's annoyance. And as a consequence, you know, people, pay, and I people hate click them. The other, yeah. Yeah. And I took one apart just the other day in a Reddit post about, I think it was a Hispanic journal that was talking about Bacardi. And uh, I, I saw that one. You yeah. know, and I just went to town on it because I thought it was completely biased in favor of, well, Bacardi and uh, the Cuban exiles and so on. But most of the time, you don't know who these people are, right? right? They've got no standing in the greater Grand Cuban. And we all know who the, the movers and shakers and the true influences are. You know, the, one, mm -hmm. the names rise to the top. They always do. Uh, so when somebody like um, Ivor Delat says something, I pay attention, mm -hmm. right? When somebody like Wes Bergen or Steve James or uh, Laurent Couvier from France or Cyril uh, Hugon or some of these guys that I know from long experience, when they talk, they usually have something interesting to say, and I want to know what they're doing, right? But when some person that you've never, you know, some freelance writer basically just puts together a list without, as you say, any context, then the list is useless. But remember that they are writing on assignment, yes. and they are also writing for a magazine that also all already has a subscriber or other user base in the tens and hundreds of thousands. Mm -hmm. yep. So our bitchiness about it really doesn't matter at all unless it engages more people to read the thing to see what's wrong with it right yeah. you know and therefore it's never going to go away the best we can hope for is a uh, takedown after takedown of each and every one of them and i don't think anybody really has i know wes has given up you know he's tried you know i've i've certainly uh, when i see something egregiously stupid i tend to address it but over and above that i think sooner or later i'm just going to issue my opinion as an opinion essay and i'm gonna say you know this is just crap and we've got to watch out for this stuff and pay attention because what it does is if we don't then we accept the stuff uncritically Right. Which is what I said to the Latina uh, magazine article on Bacardi. I says, people coming into rum will read this stuff and take it as gospel. That's the great danger of it. Not that the list is crap, but that people will believe it. Right. Oh, I can't have that for something that is complete and utter stupidity. But I want people to make up their own minds and to understand what exactly is wrong. Not that this rum is bad and that rum is good. That's entirely subjective. right? But the facts behind it, which is why I liked Tony Sachs's list so much. Right. right. Now, Tony Sachs put out a, he put out a call about six months ago about, you know, can you help me? I want to put out a, a list of 21 most important drums of the 21st century. And, and that led to an article on your on your website. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, 
<laughs> I was I was actually quite vicious. Uh, I thought he shouldn't farm out something that he's being paid to write because if you know either you know your subject or you don't, and if you know your subject, you shouldn't be asking. And if you have to ask, then you don't know your subject. So what are you doing, mm. right? But in fairness, he did contact me. He didn't hold any grudges. Um, I, I I really I want to point out how um, amazed I was by that series of events because I feel like so often the expectation is it won't go that way. You you know you publish something that was critical of something someone did and he reached out to you and you had a genuine conversation about it. And I was surprised too. I thought yeah. that he'd me a new one, but no, he was very cordial and that made me cordial in response. Right. Right. I didn't change the article one iota. I couldn't do that. And you I did write wondered. a follow on to it though, after his Which list was, was my published. obligation. Mm-hmm. And that is mm-hmm. a, something that too many people don't do. You know, they tear right. somebody a new one or they basically go off and uh, basically attack somebody, realize that they were wrong, but they never post a retraction. I don't agree with that. Take for example, the, recent thing with the Juve rum, again, we, mm-hmm. we bring this up uh, with um, Michael B. Jordan, right? He, he, within days, he did damage control. The man got up in front of a mic and said, oops, sorry, you know, completely my bad. I misinterpreted this. I have gotten educated. I know better now. I do apologize. The people of Trinidad and Tobago, I will withdraw this name. Yep. Right? Yeah. What I was actually more interested in was less his retraction than the reposting of that retraction to all those people who had been attacking him on the various Facebook clubs. Right. And of course, it was like about a 50-50 thing. Some did, some didn't. But with Tony Sachs, uh, I felt I owed him that because the list he put out was actually quite good. And for the first time, we had a list with context. Mm-hmm. This is what it is. This is why it is. And this he tried to justify his choices. And I yeah. thought that was a very good way to put a list of that nature out rather than just put, you know, 10 arrow, you know, next, 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 next. And, <laughs> Slideshow. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, Get those God, page views no, up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So Tony definitely did a bang up job, I thought, and I had to give him credit for that. And I had to point out that, listen, uh, this article aside, I must say that it came out better than I expected. I, we did talk and it was fun doing so. And I was happy that he was, you know, he was the adult about it, really, when you come to think about it. You know, I just kind of followed on behind it. <laughs> 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 but might that, Lance, might that interaction between you and Tony be indicative of where rum geeks as a whole hobby kind of need to go in order to attack? We're talking about this kind of issue right now of how do we get out of this? Of the, There's this whole realm where the, the rum geeks are, are kind of, we know our stuff, but then there's this, ex, we, we mentioned it earlier, this external, you know, Bacardi doesn't give a crap what we think and all these other things. How do we, how do we bridge that? And, and maybe what you're talking about here and the way we're doing this and is rather than be so protective, because that's what we see from the, the, the inner rum community is, oh, this is crap. Oh, this is garbage. Oh, this is, this is terrible in every way, shape and form. And we reject it outright. Maybe we need to think about a way forward that that gives more of a it's the critical part portion is still there. But there's also a bridge to say, but look, there is some portions of this that are good. And there is some things that as we continue to bridge between the large market and the rum geek market, I don't know what to call that, that we can find ways forward that might be helpful yeah. to, to continue in Absolutely. a way that is more meaningful. There is. And that is to stop with the online engagement because the online engagement just leads to echo chambers, right? Which is Mm -hmm. a separation of people from a physical space creates this adversarial environment where people literally go after each other in ways that they would never do in person. For example, when I went to the Tasting of the Century in 2018 in London, I met Matt Petrick, I met Wes Bergen, I met Steve James, Pete Holland, Gregors Nielsen was there. He's, uh, he works for 1423 now. He was an event manager back in the day. Mm-hmm. What was really fascinating about that was Wes, of course, and Steve are very close. They're, they're good friends. And uh, they have been known for taking apart anybody who uh, they have an issue with on the issue of sugar, on the issue of the GI, on whatever. Right. You know, They have created a certain adversarial mentality on the Facebook. But that's online. When you meet them, nicest guys you could imagine. They are mm-hmm. so pleasant to hang out with, right? I mean, they're funny, they're engaging, they've got stories to tell, they're great geeks. And I think that that may actually be part of the issue. There's too much of this online stuff, which unfortunately is a kind of like a necessary evil. We have to have it because otherwise right. we'll never get together, right. you know, travel being what it is. Uh, but I think that more of these in-person meetings and engagements from industry down to the consumer, if they are there, then people will actually meet each other and realize that this person who basically hated on me yesterday is actually not such a bad guy after all. There will always be a few, but not all of them. 
So I tend to not pass judgment anymore on people who go after me on Facebook, which isn't very often, but they do, you know, or basically say, oh, you, you know, you really are full of crap, Mr. Surge, well, you stop that, you know, mm-hmm. and I completely disagree with you. Well, you know, if I meet you over a beer, we can talk about it, then I'm sure we'll have a, diff- a much different conversation. Maybe rum one. instead of beer. O- over a beer? <laughs> oh, man, I've loved uh, everything you said until that point. I don't know what oh, happened. I, I just dropped in your estimation, right? <laughs> <laughs> Fine, the shot. Um, but you understand what I'm saying. It's the personal touch that makes yeah. a great difference. I've had long conversations with people who I've never met. But once I did meet them, sometimes it became even better because we were able to talk. Pete Holland was a guy like that. I mean, I just love the guy. I mean, he's just such a friendly fellow. Everything that you see on his website or his, his Facebook page is exactly the way he is when you meet him in person. While on the other hand, you'd get a completely different impression from somebody uh, like, uh, well, like Wes, for example, right? Who is such a sterling chap in real life, right? That you kind of look at these two people and like, what, what just <laughs> happened, you know? So yeah, more engagement is nice. Uh, it's it's yeah. good to meet the producers. It's good to go on distillery visits, uh, to meet the guys that uh, have all these ways of doing things, you know. And uh, I hope that once the world opens, that more of that can happen. I really do. But I yeah, think that's yeah. the way forward for sure. Education and personal engagement is really the keys to it for me. Absolutely, man. We have covered a lot of ground on this interview, and it feels like there is yet more that could be uh, covered for sure. Just like you were saying, last last year (laughs) was exactly the same thing. We're talking, and then I got cut off, and it was just like there was this long list of stuff I wanted to talk about, couldn't do it. Yeah. Well, I I would encourage everyone if you haven't already check out the Key Rums of the World series. Like I said, we're going to link to that. Uh, We referred to many other works uh, on your website and up other websites throughout the interview. We'll try to link as much as possible we can in the show notes but yeah so much to look forward to i think you were you've referred to i think 20 different opinion pieces that are in the works right now that i'm looking forward to seeing now but before we wrap up as you know as i've made you aware in advance we have a tradition on the show the rapid fire segment we always describe it as optional and yet no one has (laughs) ever declined so at this point it's 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 starting to become slightly less optional but i I will still ask you if you are do it or be damned (laughs) exactly (laughs) exactly do it or you will be taken apart somewhere on facebook you up for it (laughs) <laughs> yeah, let's go. <laughs> All right. So I have 60 seconds on the clock and go. All right. Neat or on the rocks? Neat. Column, pot, or blend? Pot. Aged or unaged? Both. All right. Molasses or cane juice? Both. <laughs> Good answers. All right. With your key rums, do you go Appleton 12 or Dorley's 12? Appleton 12. And Appleton 12 or Mount Gay XO? Ooh, that's Mount a Gay XO. One. By a, okay. by a smidgen. Wow, okay. the Barbados okay. rum one. Amazing. Oh. All right. How many hours a week on average do you actually spend thinking about writing or tasting rum? 24. <laughs> All right. The Spread name, over the seven lone... days, right? I mean, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Upon hearing the name the Lone Caner, the majority of people, or at least Americans, are likely to recall the Lone Ranger. If you had a horse, what would its name be? <laughs> stump. Wow. <laughs> Next. I, I, I really stumped about this one. I'll get back to you, though. <laughs> All right, your favorite person to share a glass of rum with. This is an important one for you at the Lone Caner. There's too many. I like your honesty. <laughs> There's just too many people. Which rum making region of the world are you most curious to explore right now? Australia. All right, you reference a specific notorious person online from time to time who you call Sir Scrotimus. <laughs> is Sir Scrotimus your rum nemesis? No. He used to be, but not anymore. And that's time. All right. I didn't give you the worst one, Lance. I saved you from the silliest one there. I'm still thinking about the horse. <laughs> <laughs> you can get back to us with your name for the horse. Yeah, wow. Yeah. That's, that's a tough one. Silver was the, the horse name in the Lone Ranger, right? But that doesn't seem yeah. like a good rum-based name, definitely. No, I was thinking <laughs> of the family tree from the Heisenberg distillery, but uh, I don't know if anybody gets that reference at yeah. all. So, I... How about Heisenberg? Let's go with it. <laughs> Let's go with Heisenberg. <laughs> yeah, Heisenberg, hi <hi-yo! laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, Lance, I think we, we've gotten to, to everything in this in this two hours um, that, that we can reasonably cover. Uh, before we go, though, is there any, anything else you wanted to add? Enjoy the rum. Just uh, have a good time with it. Don't worry too much about what other people, including myself, say. Um, <laughs> but know why you like something. It's not enough to just say, I do, and have a feeling. The feeling isn't enough. Try and understand what it is that you do like about it so that you can get others like it and you know, uh, bring other people along with you. I think that's uh, a standard rule I try for myself. And I don't keep my likes or dislikes to myself i write about them but i try to justify that and that's always a good rule to follow so enjoy yourselves basically is what it's all about right 
I love that. It still is a very convivial drink. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's easy to forget that sometimes, especially if you spend a lot of time on online communities, but (laughs) it's true. Yeah, for sure. Lance, thanks again so much for for yeah. taking the time to hang out with us, and hopefully, oh, you know, guys, we, it's been we, a real pleasure. I really did enjoy this. Yeah, well, and, and we made so much mention too. of yeah. the power of meeting people in person. So hopefully, at some point in the next year or so, yeah. we'll be able to uh, to share to share a, a dram together in person. That would be that would be wonderful. But not a beer, right, John? <laughs> not a beer. It better be a good rum. That's right. All right. Well, I got several. I mean, I've got tons that are just waiting to be opened and cracked. So I'm hoping to share with you guys too one of these days. All right, everyone, thank you so much for listening to our interview with Lance. As we've mentioned throughout the show, all of the links to the key rums of the World Series and the various entries in that series, we're going to put those in the show notes. So be sure to check those out. I think you'll really enjoy, even after having heard Lance talk about them, go in, read those, spend some time with them, go back, revisit those rums, tell us what you think about the, the experience of doing that, share it with Lance. He's, he's online as well. We'll link to everywhere you can find him on social media. And John, where, where can people find us on social media yeah we we we're at uh facebook instagram and twitter at the rumcast so that's at the rumcast one word and i I, we haven't mentioned this in a while will but i wanted to also mention if you're new to the podcast or maybe you've been listening for some time now but still haven't left us a review uh stop this recording right now and uh bang those five stars do it do it um no i mean it really uh we appreciate everyone and, and listening and we do really enjoy when people leave the reviews it it does help people find us uh, i noticed will we're sitting at 60 reviews now on that's uh, awesome. Apple podcast it is great it doesn't seem like that's a lot necessarily but in the podcasting world that's like less than five percent of podcasts wow so that is a cool thing and we're appreciative the upper um, and crust i noticed yeah, and I noticed we we are now showing up as one of the first few results when people search for rum on the Apple Podcast app. So please do so. It does help people uh, who love rum like you do and like we do find out about us. And, you know, it, it keeps us going, too. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, with all that, uh, thank you all so much for listening. Uh, you will hear from us again in a couple of weeks. And if you happen to see uh, either of us at a convention and want to play some games while drinking rum, <laughs> hey, just ask. We're down to play. Perfect. All right, see you next time.